Thank you. Good morning, members. Good morning to officers and any members of the public who are viewing the live stream today. And welcome to this meeting of South Cambridgeshire District Council Planning Committee. Uh, my name is Peter Fane. I'm the chair of the committee. Um, just recently taken over. And my vice chair, Henry Batchelor, is beside me here. I'll ask members of the committee to introduce themselves in a minute. Um, just a few notes before we get started. Um, if you're in the council chamber, you need to be aware that everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, is likely to be broadcast at some point. Um, the camera follows the microphone being switched on. So councillors and officers are requested to wait a couple of seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up. Um, Obviously, if the fire alarm sounds, then please leave the chamber, make your way down the stairs. The exits are clearly marked. Um, don't use the lift, of course. And the safe assembly point is next to the marketing suite, halfway along the business park. Um, for those participating in the meeting via the live stream, please use the chat column to indicate that you want to speak. And please don't use the chat column for any other purposes during the meeting. Um, so make sure your device is fully charged before you speak and switch your microphone and camera off unless you're invited to otherwise, uh, if you would. You may want to ensure that you've switched off or silenced any other devices so they don't interrupt proceedings. And you may want to use a headset if available when speaking. Um, when you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure that your microphone is switched on. And when you finish addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately. Speak slowly and clearly. Please don't talk over or interrupt anyone else. Um, please note that if we do need to vote on any item, we'll do so via the electronic voting system using the microphones in front of you in the chamber. And that means that only those present in the chamber can vote. Uh, and incidentally proposed or second um, motions, recommendations. Um, to the committee members present in the chamber, I will now invite each of you in turn to introduce yourselves. So members, after I call your name, please just turn on your camera and microphone if you're at home. Uh, wait two seconds and say your name so that your presence can be noted. As I said earlier, my name is Councillor Peter Fane and I'm the member for the Shelford Ward. My vice chair is Councillor Henry Batchelor. Morning, everyone. Councillor Henry Batchelor, one of the members for Linton and vice chair of the committee. And we also have in the room Councillor Martin Kahn, Dr. Martin Kahn. You can tap in, Martin. And we'll come back, Dr. Ca Doc Councillor Dr. Claire Daunton. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Claire Daunton, and I'm one of the members for the Fendit and, and Fullborn Ward, um, substituting for Councillor Halings. Councillor Joe's Hales. Good morning, Councillor Joe's Hales. Uh, one of the members for Melbourne. Thank you. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Councillor Jeff Harvey. I'm the member for Balsham Ward. Councillor Judith Ripith. Good morning, Councillor Judith Griffith, one of the members for Milton and Waterbeach Ward. Councillor Heather Williams. Good morning, Heather Williams, and I represent the Mordens Ward. My apologies, Councillor Deborah Roberts. I think you did it on purpose, Chairman. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, everybody. I'm Deborah Roberts. I'm the District Councillor for the Foxton Ward. Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. I'm Richard Williams. I'm the member for the Whittlesford Ward. And Councillor Eileen Wilson. Good morning, Eileen Wilson, Councillor for Cottenham Ward. And now we'll go back to Dr. Martin Kahn. Councillor Martin Kahn, one of the members for Histon, Impeton and Orchard Park. Are there any other members present, please? Good. Right. Um, and I can confirm that the meeting is quarried. We also have four officers in the chamber. Um, Nigel Blaisby, delivery manager. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. Uh, Stephen Reed, senior planning lawyer. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. Michael Sexton, who is the area development manager. 
Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. Uh, and Rebecca Dobson, who's the uh, Democratic Services Manager. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. And uh, I'm sorry to say that Lawrence is not well today, so he's not with us today. Um, if at any time a member leaves the meeting, would they please make that fact known to me or to my vice chair so that it can be recorded in the minutes? Um, I intend breaking for uh, 15 minutes, about 11.45, and if the meeting is still going on, if the meeting is still going on, at about 3.45, uh, and I propose we have a 45-minute break for lunch at about 1.30, if that's all right with members. Um, hopefully members have the main agenda pack dated 1st of March and also the online agenda supplements. Um, so you should have the plans pack supplement dated 3rd of March and the planning appeal supplement dated 4th of March with the restricted papers in pink attached. Um, if any members aren't able to access the restricted supplement. There are pink copies available. So do we have any apologies for absence? Chair, the apologies as noted already um, via the fact that there are substitute arrangements for Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins and Councillor Pippa Halings. Thank you. Thank you. Declarations of interest. Can I just make it clear that if there are declarations specific to item 12, we will come to them later. So if any members have declarations in relation to any item of business on this agenda, uh, please let us know. Dr. Claire Daunton. Um, yes, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I want to declare that I'm a county councillor um, and also for item, um, item 9, um, I'm one of the local members. I've been present at discussions, but I come to the matter afresh. Right. And Heather Williams? Thank you, Chair. Um, just to declare that because projects in relation to the GCP are mentioned, I'm a member of the Greater Cambridge Partnership Assembly and local member, I believe, some of the appeals. Right. And I think you would like to yeah, Myself. Thank you, Chair. Um, item five uh, i'm the local member for great abington so have had um visits around granta park uh, but obviously that will in no way affect my decision making today thank you and councillor jeff harvey thank you chair uh, whilst i'm member for balsham uh, in my capacity as councillor i'm actually a resident of great abington but um i haven't had any discussions on item five and i come to it afresh <coughs> right and councillor eileen wilson Thank you, Chair. I, I, I'm not sure that this is um, um, required, but I'm also a member of the Greater Cambridge Partnership Joint Assembly. Right. Thank you. I think that is all the declarations of interest at this stage. As I say, we will take any declaration separately under item 12, if that's relevant. Um, minutes of the previous meeting. I, I'm sorry to say the minutes of the previous meeting have not been finalised in time, so we will come back to that at a future meeting. They'll be considered when available. Um, item five, Granter Park. Uh, so coming to the main business, item five on our agenda is the Granter Park application um, 21 slash 03822 full. And I'll ask the area development manager, Michael Sexton, to present the report. Thank you, Chair. Um, there's quite a few updates, so I'm going to do the updates on screen, just so it's clear to everyone. Um, just let me share my screen. Yeah. Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry. Um, could I possibly ask that people do speak directly into the microphone, please? Thank you. Um, so, updates on this item, um, apologies for the text heaviness, but we have, since the publication of the Planning Committee agenda last week, there have been uh, 10 further representations of objection made to the application, uh, received from Burkitt's Legal, Cambridge Past, Present and Future, uh, CPRE, which is the Campaign to Protect Rural England, the Countryside Charity, uh, Flourish Produce, Four Winds, Hammersmith Parish Council, Wild Country Organics, 
37 Westfield, uh, one Newmarket Road, and one from an unconfirmed address. Um, a lot of the representations contain a material that has been raised before and is covered in the officer report, but just to try and uh, highlight this to members as best I can. Um, the representations are either are on the website or will be on the website shortly because they have come in last minute and there is redaction required by our support team. But in summary, the following concerns have been raised in those additional comments. Um, biodiversity impact, uh, which is set out in the report. Uh, concerns by issues of flooding and potential effects on the River Granta, again, set out in the report. Uh, development appears to be speculative with no declared tenants, again, set out in the report. Heritage impact included the listed arboretum and gardens, which I will come on to during the presentation. Uh, perhaps to a parish, parish council would like to make it known that if they were formally consulted, they would almost certainly have requested refusal of the application. Um, reference has also been made <coughs> for, to previous applications for masts, uh, telecoms towers, adjacent to the site, which were refused or dismissed at appeal uh, for being prominent and discordant features in the landscape. And again, I'll come on to that a bit more during the presentation. Um, the building itself being prominent, uh, that would have a negative impact on the countryside and landscape character that would not be screened. Um, restricted covenants uh, relating to the woodland, that isn't set out in the report, that is something that's come in very recently, but covenants are slightly separate to the planning process and would be a legal civil matter to resolve separately. Um, and traffic impact, which is well detailed in the report. Um, and perhaps an appropriate time just to make members aware, we will be joined by Tam Parry from the County Council this morning, um, probably from 10.45 onwards. So should we have any questions on transport impacts, Tam will be here uh, for members. Um, and again, just for clarity, members would have received some of the above material directly, um, either from the objectors themselves or via the Council's Democratic Services team. There was also a letter dated the 7th of March titled Pampersford Estate Update to uh, 21 slash 03 full, uh, which was circulated by an objector who is speaking today. So members should have had sight of a 12 page document in advance of this meeting. That's it for updates. So I will move on to my presentation um, unless there's a need for anything around the updates in particular. Okay, so this is a, a full planning application for the erection of a research and development building and associated deck car park, landscaping and associated infrastructure at Site 1 Granta Park in Great Abington. The site is outlined in red with the wider site outlined in, or areas of the wider site outlined in blue. Uh, so it is on the western edge of the park adjacent to the main access and the A11 running along the western boundary. For context, this is an aerial view of the site. Um, so you can see that Grants Park is based around a central open space. Uh, the site in question is site one here, which is one of the last development parcels to come forward on the site. Um, again, at the western edge of the site, adjacent to the main entrance. In terms of key constraints, um, I attempt to draw these to members' attention. There is, I appreciate it might not come through particularly clearly, a light purple line all around Grants Park um, which identifies it as an established employment area under policy E15 of the local plan, the site outlined in red. The park is surrounded by um, tree belts on all, more or less all boundaries, uh, which are covered by tree preservation orders, which are denoted by the blue polygons. Uh, to the north of the site, the red line is the River Granta, which is a, a county wildlife site, and you can see areas either side of that are identified as flood risk, but the application site itself is not at uh, Westing Flood Zone 1, low risk. Um, Abington Hall, which is a listed building, is located to the eastern side of the park and within the conservation area of Great Abington, uh, which only extends marginally into the park. To the west of the site is Pampersford Hall, um, another listed building um, with a uh, registered park and garden surrounding it, denoted by this brown line. Um, in my report, the heritage section does set out an assessment of the impact of the proposed building on those heritage assets. Um, just to draw members' attention to this uh, registered park and garden, because my report um, doesn't explicitly say that the separation between the site and this designated area is 570 metres for, so for reasons set out in the report, akin to the impact on the, the list of buildings and the conservation area, the separation distance is such that officers will be satisfied there's no adverse harm. 
So this is the proposed site plan, the main research and development building is this building here in the southern part of the site, and the proposed multi-storey car park is this building here, located to the rear of the existing Franklin building within the park. And again, the site entrance right to the south. Uh, this is just a typical floor plan of the, the building. Um, it will deliver just over 11,000 square meters of research and development space uh, with areas of lab and office, um, and that occurs over the four floors. This, these are the elevations of the proposed building. Um, it will be the tallest building within the site as set out in the report. Um, but as you'll see as we go through this, it's a very high quality design building. It will be delivering BRIAM excellence, a detail which is secured by condition, and potentially around 450 jobs depending on the tenancies. Uh, this is the multi-storey car park, which is a, a smaller building compared to site one. And you can see this building here in the bottom left, that's the existing Franklin building. So the height of the car park is no higher um, than the Franklin building, other than potentially areas where the staircase is enclosed. So that should be relatively well screened within the park. Just to draw members' attention to a few extracts on the design access statement, coming back to the height of the building, the right-hand side uh, is a section plan through the proposed building, which is located here on the western edge of the site, comparing it to existing buildings within Park, so the Illuminar building, which is actually located slightly off this screen here, um, and the Gilead building, which is located here, just as a comparison to other buildings on the site. And again, just some visuals so members can see the design quality and aesthetics qualities of the building. Um, and it's an opportunity to have a, being located at the front entrance of the site, it's an opportunity to have a signature building um, at the site entrance. This is a view taken from the uh, cricket, across the cricket ground, across the open space, back towards the site, so you can see how it will sit within the context of the um, existing buildings in the park. You've got the Gilead building, uh, which I just showed you a section of on the right, um, the Flowers building, and to the west, uh, Portway building, and then the proposed site one. Um, this is a section through the site, um, just to try and, try and show to members, you've got this tree belt to the west, and to the south, so the building will sit slightly above the height of that woodland belt to the west. And as part of the application, there is a woodland height section study, which again just confirms that the view the building will sit above the existing tree lines, but when perceived from ground level and looking over the trees, that impact of the building is, is reduced. Uh, there is a verified views document, and I suspect this will be the main part of the debate, or key part of the debate today, um, which looks to see to sort of demonstrate how the building will sit within the wider context outside of the site. So the photos on the right-hand side are from viewpoints two um, and viewpoints three, um, which show the building dashed sitting within and behind the existing tree belt. Um, these views where the buildings will be are largely transient views, which you'll appreciate on approaching the park. The most evident location for the building will be on approach over the bridge um, across over the A11 and into the park. So this is a visual of how that building will sit. It's a verified view of how the building will sit within the context. So it will be, it will be visible and that's set out in the report. The verified views also incorporates uh, Hayden's uh, arboriculturals have um, undertaken a study of how that tree belt will develop over the next five or 10 years. So it's anticipated in five years time, trees will have grown a few meters higher and will add further screening to the building. There is a, a landscape and visual impact assessment, and I appreciate these might not come through too clearly on the screen, um, which is sought to, again, look how the building will sit in the context of the park and its wider surroundings. So, um, again, you will see elements of the building uh, from, from long distance, but it will be akin to some of the existing buildings in Luminar here, but I don't think you'll be able to make it out too clearly on screen. Um, this is a view from Bournebridge Road, which is to the north of the site. Um, so you've got the existing Gilead building just sitting above the tree line here. And then the proposed building will be located um, in this area. So again, that built form will edge slightly above those trees. Key material considerations, um, there's quite a lot, um, as all set out in the report. Um, there are a lot of benefits that the building would bring. It is one of the last plots to be developed on the site. Um, clearly it will be visible, and I don't think the report hides away from that, but um, 
officer's view is it's not sufficiently harmful to, to warrant a refusal, applicant, a refusal of the application, particularly against the benefits. So those are the key materials considerations as set out in the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Michael. Um, now, at this point, we progress to public speakers, but exceptionally on this occasion, it may be helpful if members have any questions arising directly out of that presentation, that we take them now while the slides and so on are easily available to us. Do we have anything, or is everyone prepared to postpone questions and clarification until the debate later on? Right. We then proceed to our public speakers. And first, I'm happy to welcome Kerry, Kerry Newell. Thank you. Mrs. Newell, I suspect you know the rules of these events. We will give you three minutes. Um, I think you know how the microphone works. And if you wouldn't mind staying at the end in case there are any members have particular questions of clarification out of your presentation. So um, start when you're ready, please, Mrs. Newell. Good morning, Chairman and members, and thank you. Can you please refer to pages four and five of the illustrated letter that you were sent on the 7th? I was Principal Conservation Officer, both Case Officer and Statutory Consultee on this site from 2008 to 2013. It is one of the special allocated technological sites the local plan allows in open, open countryside, tightly controlled by a master plan to minimize its impact on the landscape and local environment. Part three of this policy, E15, states, permission will be refused where there would be a negative impact on surrounding countryside or landscape character. The master plan dates from 2008, based on an outline consent for the site in 2003 for an enabling development expanding the Welding Institute. Consent was given in 2006 for technologies as well as welding, provided it remained in the same ownership unit. The physical development, management and enhancements of the outline remained the same. The report refers to a master plan of 2015 that is for an adjoining site outside the blue line, which is open farmland in the Granter Park consent. Two planning inspectors have dismissed development of public benefit on the basis of the high quality of the landscape here. Granter Park is part of the 85 acres of Abington Hall designed by Humphrey Repton in 1803 and is on the Cambridgeshire Register of Parks and Gardens. It adjoins Pampersford Hall, an internationally important arboretum on the National Register of Parks and Gardens listed grade two star. They adjoin the green corridor designed by Alan Mitchell. It is therefore a valued landscape. The key views affected are from the entrance from the direction of the A505, the parkland, and the public playing fields on Bourne Bridge Road, which are also part of the Repton landscape. Photos show the views are permanent and extensive. It is concerning officers refuse to publicize the 2008 master plan. It is clear from this and from the descriptions in the report that the application does not comply with the restrictions on height, massing, footprint, parking, floor area, lighting, drainage, and positioning of development. All of these changes have an adverse effect on landscape. The proposed main building of four storeys plus plant storey plus flues... Mrs. Newell, can I ask you to wind up very quickly? Please? ...is two storeys higher than the master plan and one and two storeys higher than any other building. The overlays show this will be well above the wooded skyline and into the TPO woodland. The multi-storey car park is four storeys higher than the master plan and will also project above the trees. The proposal is for three buildings within the space allocated for one building and open landscape. The main building is designed as a landmark statement and to be floodlit to emphasize this. Mr. This Neil, is large-scale urban for your design imposed on the countryside to, uh, and a precedent thank you very for much. doing so. This does not comply with E15, with S2B 
and with HQ1, and is both a negative impact on surrounding countryside and on landscape character. Thank you very Thank much, you. members, for listening. Thank you for your presentation. Do members have any questions of direct clarification arising that, from that for Mrs. Newell? No, I don't see any. Mrs. Newell, thank you very much for your, your presentation. Thank you. Our next public speaker in a moment is Orestes Georgiou Glue. Um, Orestes is Vice President for Development at Biomed Reality, Realty, sorry, <laughs> the, the applicants here. Um, you will have heard my earlier guidance. Um, please start when you're ready. Uh, I think your microphone is not switched on. You just need to press the right hand button. Here we go. Can you hear me now? That's it. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, members. Uh, Granta Park has been a scientific center for excellence of international significance for more than 20 years. The amazing work undertaken here has recently been seen during the uh, pandemic of COVID-19. The proposals before you today represent the culmination of extensive design, engagement and consultation with officers, statutory consultees, our tenant base and the local communities. And the feedback has been informing our proposals and we're very thankful for that. Granta Park has played an active role in the local community for many years and hosts regular events such as the great Abington 10K Run and holds, uh, maintains a very strong relationship with um, Great Abington uh, uh, Primary School as well. The site sits within an established employment area and the proposed building makes best use of the land available. The proposed building is located at the front of the park, therefore set further away from the adjoining villages and residents and we have undertaken a detailed visual impact assessment, including verified views, to demonstrate the limited appreciation one has from the surroundings. Uh, we have also undertaken uh, detailed discussions and modelling with the highways agency at Cambridgeshire County Council. The proposed building is bringing forward 303 uh, additional car parking spaces, representing a 60% uh, of single car mode share. Um, this also helps with the uh, overall reduction that we've seen at Granta Park over the last five years. Uh, the park has a very robust travel plan in place, uh, which includes shuttle bus services to and from Cambridge and Wilford stations. Uh, that's the second most popular transport mode that we operate out of the campus. It is in our interest to maintain a very robust travel plan to make sure that the tenants that work here can continue attracting top talent. Uh, Cambridge has experienced a significant shortfall of um, lack of avo available laboratory space. We are currently tracking 850,000 square feet of pent up demand. And we're in detailed discussions at the moment with a tenant for a preload of 100% of the proposed building before you today. The scheme delivers a uh, building of exemplar architectural design, uh, quality of the highest standards, and uh, seeks to bring forward technologies that address the climate emergency, the results of which we are experiencing daily. Uh, some of the uh, scheme parameters here that I'm going to outline are 27.4% overall reduction of carbon uh, emission reductions, REM excellent, a well gold, 10% provision of EV charging stations, including 50% containment infrastructure. This is the first scheme in Cambridge to, to deliver this. There is also a net gain in biodiversity, 450 new jobs across the uh, scheme. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, members and very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much and very good timing. Now, do we have any direct questions? I see uh, Heather Williams. Thank you. Through yourself, Chair. Um, it was just in relation to electricity capacity, because we know that's something that's being discussed at the moment, whether there is capacity um, for the building and the car park to be charging so many electrical um, vehicles. Did you hear that right? Thank you. Um, yes, indeed, there is, a, there is a significant shortfall of uh, electricity capacity within Cambridge. Uh, we have been in active discussions with UKPN and about four years ago we secured 7.4 um, uh, MVA of additional capacity that represents a £4 million uh, investment that we've undertaken. Uh, in addition to that, we have recently secured 1,850 uh, KVA that uh, addresses the issues of this particular scheme, including the building and the car park. 
Uh, I think it's worth noting as well, going back to my point about the, the climate emergency in particular, um, you know, yes, there is an issue with, with uh, uh, the uh, electricity, but we are challenged to do um, more with less. You know, we, we need to start making our buildings more efficient, which is what this building is doing. Uh, we need to start using electricity uh, in a more efficient way, running the buildings better, and uh, introducing new sustainable technologies like air source heat pumps and PVs, uh, which is very much what we're looking to do here. Thank you. Question, I think, from uh, Councillor Ripith. Um, good morning. Um, you mentioned your travel plan and you mentioned shuttle buses. Can I just ask a little bit more detail about how frequent um, do they run throughout the day? Do they sort of bear in mind that not everybody goes to work at nine and comes back at five? Um, just a bit more detail, please. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're very, very keen to, to continue promoting alternative transport modes and obviously the shuttle bus services is, is one of those initiatives. We run 13 buses in the morning, nine of which go to Cambridge Station. So there is Cambridge Station, uh, there is one stop um, uh, outside, I want to get this right, Homerton College, one at the uh, uh, roundabout at Adam Brooks, and then it heads over to, to Granter Park. The journey takes about 24 minutes, I, I'm a regular user myself of the service. Um, it runs uh, at intervals between uh, 6.30 in the morning and I think the last bus departs from Cambridge Station are about uh, 9.30. Uh, there is also three shuttles that run to Whittleford Station. Um, and that's 13 services in the morning, 13 in the evening. As I said, there is a, uh, it's the second most popular mode. Uh, they, they're very, very popular. We are looking at increasing those uh, as it comes you know, uh, over, over the time um, alongside other you know, initiatives that we're promoting on campus. Okay, and with Cambridge South, I presume you would, it, when that comes forward, you would also run a shuttle bus service from there? Ab absolutely, and again, you know, going back to my earlier point about being a regular user of the, of the, the service myself from the station, if we think about the station uh, to, to, um, to Granter Park, and we think that the distance from the Cambridge station to um, the Adam Brooks roundabout is about one-fifth of that journey, that takes, on average, 17 minutes, you know, because of the congestion on, on Hills Road. The rest of the journey, which is really four-fifths of, of the balance, takes about eight minutes, believe it or not. Um, we, we think that uh, strategic initiatives such as the uh, new station that is being proposed at Cambridge South, and indeed the CSET, that is another great example of uh, alternative transport modes, will certainly help increase that. And we will be, you know, to your point, supplementing with additional shuttle services, you know, at Cambridge South, which makes that journey, um, you know, even more reliable and, you know, perhaps more desirable as well, given the, the, the limited time it takes to, to get from A to B. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think, did I see Councillor Harvey? Yes. Yeah, yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I just wanted to raise a, a matter of um, accuracy, really. Um, I don't know if the other members received this um, uh, sort of document from the developers, which obviously, um, you know, promotes um, the development or seeks to. Um, and it says that um, in the second paragraph, Grant Park is open and accessible to local residents who often use it for exercise and dog walking. Um, that's not my understanding. I think it used to be, and that was kind of part of an informal compact with the village residents um, going back to 2003. But um, actually, for about five or six years now, um, we've had security gates and you need uh, an access code to... Um, so I wonder if you could clarify that. Forgive me, Chairman. Is that a question that I can, I can answer? I, I think, yes. Yeah, Let me just you. first establish that is the document you're referring to. Perhaps you could confirm that is from, from yourselves if Councillor Harvey just shows it to you again. Y yes, no, I, I recognise please. the document. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, yes, indeed, that, that, that is a point that has been raised on a number of uh, occasions with the, the, the villages and our consultation uh, with them. Uh, I think it's worth noting to members that Granta Park is owned by two different entities. You know, there is, there is the element that we are, you know, uh, controlling to the front of the park, which is the Biomed Realty Ownership, and to the rear of the park, the Welding Institute still controls a significant proportion of that land. The gates that the council is referring to sit on land controlled by, by the Welding Institute. So unfortunately, you know, it, it sits outside our direct control. We have no control over that. Uh, worth noting that from the front of the campus, you know, the entrance that we control uh, at the roundabout, we, you know, uh, anyone, you know, that has got, you know, a, a need to come to the park or wishes to come to the park, you know, can continue doing that. You know, we're open. Uh, a lot of the uh, villages actually use um, the nursery that we provide. Uh, they use, um, you know, there is a, 
number of villagers also using the gym, the natural uh, gym that we have on site. Um, and, you know, we, we keep, you know, I appreciate it's feet further away from the villages and that, that is not desirable, perhaps, you know, because it's a longer journey. But, yeah, you know, as grants of park and biomaterialty, we, we're still very much open. And we wish to continue engaging with TWI to come to a solution where we could, in the foreseeable future, reopen those gates in a way that preserves their or addresses their particular concerns of security um, and, and come up with a solution that, that addresses, you know, the, the desires of both parties as well. We want to play a mediating role to, to ensure that can happen. Right. Thank you for that. I'm sure all present will have noticed uh, what you say about wish for the future. Um, but for the moment, also, Councillor Deborah Roberts has a question for you, I think. Thank you, Ch Chairman, and through you, Chairman. Um, good morning. Um, I found your explanation there a little interesting uh, because to be writing to us all telling us that there's free access wasn't actually correct, was it? Um, and I would like to ask you some questions. Um, I'm not quite clear in my own mind. Um, is the, are the buildings that you uh, put for forward, uh, have you actually got tenants for them yet? Because during the and in the paperwork, there is talk of people being concerned that it's a speculative application. And my next question is, I'm sure you carefully listened to the previous speaker who referred to the master plan, which this application does not seem to be compliant with. Did you read the master plan? And if you did, why have you chosen to ignore the thrust of that master plan, which is concerned about bulk buildings and height of buildings and number of buildings? So if you did read that master plan, which would have restricted um, lots of the things that you've put into your application, why, therefore, have we got such an application in front of us today? Is it just a try-on and a speculative application? Right, thank, thank you, Councillor. There's a few questions here that I, I'll try and, and um, go through. The first one is, again, going back to the access point. You know, I come back to the point that on our ownership, the land that we control, that is within our, uh, you know, absolute control, that is open to the public. And I want to make clear that obviously we are in discussions with TWI on the access on their land, but as you will appreciate, it's not something that we can control. You know, it sits outside our direct ownership. Um, in terms of the tenant question, I've got a, um, a list here of um, you know, requirements that we're actively tracking. Very happy to make it available to, to members. Uh, it represents 825,000 square feet of active requirements. So these are tenants that are currently on the market. And as I mentioned earlier in my summary, there is also one party that we are in direct discussions with to take a prelude on 100% of this building. Um, again, worth noting that the Portway building, uh, which was a recent refurbishment at Granta Park, we completed in December of last year, that had 90,000 square feet. That was indeed a speculative development as a refurb at the time. Um, we had terms out to 270,000 square feet worth of, of demand. Uh, we ended up pre-leasing the space within four weeks of it coming to the market. Um, and a lot of these tenants that uh, were local businesses had to go elsewhere, like Stevenage and Oxford. Um, but there is certainly a tenant, as I said, that we are in advanced discussions with. Unfortunately, I can't disclose the name because of SEC, you know, reasons, you know, that they're, they're raising funding in New York at the moment, and we are strictly bound to, to not mention anything on that front. But again, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to make this um, uh, report here available to members to look at all the, the various requirements that we're looking at. Um, and again, going back to the board, Granta Park has got no availability. You know, we're 100% leased. In fact, the welding industry is converting the restaurant into tenanted space because they have nowhere to put their um, the, the businesses that, that, are, that are seeking to grow. Um, your point about the master plan, uh, to, to be perfectly frank, I'm not 100% sure um, which uh, master plan uh, the previous speaker was referring to. We have gone through a very detailed review through our planning consultants and uh, officers uh, of the um, uh, local authority here of all uh, master plans and uh, original consents dating back to 1993 that are relevant to this parcel of land. You know, there is obviously various applications around Granta Park. It, it, the, the, the previous speaker may have been referring to the land that is again owned by TWI, the Welding Institute, which sits further east of our site, and they had put forward a scheme in 2008 
to expand their own operation as, as a welding institute with through new, three new buildings that were actually opened in 2014. That, that is slightly different, dare I say, and I would welcome again the case officer can perhaps provide a bit more detail on that, but the, the master plan uh, that goes back to the Eric Parry scheme relating to Granta Park and the design guide that was devised back in, um, in um, the early 2000s, I think is, is perhaps more relevant as far as, as this site is concerned. Thank you very much for that. I think there's been a number of questions answered, asked and answered there. I should say that when, before we come to the debate, there will be a chance to seek clarification from officers on any of these points. So thank you very much. Thank you. And our next speaker, I think, is uh, Tony Orgy. Speak on, I think, on behalf of Great Abington Parish Council, perhaps in introducing yourself, you just clarify whether you're also speaking on behalf of a Little Abington or whether you'll be sharing your time on that. Tony Orgy, welcome. You know the procedure, I know. Thank you. Um, Little Abington is joining us through um, the web, and um, uh, I'll be speaking, and then uh, Via Archer will make some comments. I am speaking on behalf of Great Abington Parish Council, and thank you for letting me address you. The proposed uh, Site 1 building is tall, taller than any other on the Granta Park site, and is located on the highest part of Granta Park. In the Parish Council's view, the proposed building would be an overtly dominant feature of the landscape, being 22.5 metres to the top of the building, excluding flues, and would rise substantially above the tree belt between it and Newmarket Road. The tree belt is 12 to 14 metres, so you can see how high it is. The Parish Council has been concerned for some considerable time about the cumulative impact of successive planning applications on the Granter Park site, including the traffic consequences of the proposed buildings. This application refers to about 450 new jobs and an additional 301 car parking spaces, thus providing parking for about 67% of the additional jobs. The transport assessment gives an arrival figure of 143 cars in the morning peak and 107 departures in the evening peaks, based on 301 car parking spaces. Consider how many additional peak time arrivals and departures would be likely to arise from the 1,018 car parking spaces in the current reserve matters application for Granta Park Phase 2, Site 2. I should say that local experience pre-pandemic was of peak time hold-ups at the roundabout outside the entrance to Granta Park, with on occasions traffic queuing back onto the A505 uh, in both directions. The 2017 travel plan stated an intent to promote walking routes. No five years later, there are still no footways on the, par on the roads leading to or from Granta Park. So although people can access Granta Park, as the Rusty says through the front entrance, there's no footpath they can walk on to get there. Is the parish council being nimby by opposing this application? I would argue not so. One of the most recent other applications was for the Portway building, which has just been referred to which is immediately to the right of the Granta Park entrance. The site one that we're talking about immediately on the left. The Grand, uh, Great Abington Parish Council response to the Portway building was Great Abington Parish Council recommends approval of this application. So why the difference in the Parish Council's response? The two buildings are quite different in terms of scale and massing. The Portway building is two-storey, does not rise above its surroundings and is well screened whereas the proposed Site 1 building is dominant, overtly dominant, and would have a severe and negative impact on the surroundings and landscape. And I'd like to conclude by two images. One image is the image shown on page 36 of the applicant's design and access statement, part one. Um, and the other... Um, is... Um, Yeah, sorry, what's being shown are, are four slides put forward by Little Abington. If we could just go to the first one of those. That's the view from Bournebridge Road, um, and Via Archer should be joining us on the link. Um, yes, I'm here, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Thank you. Um, first of all, good morning, Chairman and members, and thank you very much for this opportunity to speak briefly. I'd like to state that Little Abington Parish Council also recommends refusal, and we support the points made by Great Abington Parish Council regarding the, the mass and the visibility of the building, and therefore the harm to the local um, environment and the harm to the village setting. And again, this first slide shows where the, the proposed building would be visible above the tree line. We also have concerns regarding the increase in traffic, both from the proposed Site 1 building and the Reserve Matters application for Phase 2, Site 2. Um, in particular, the lack of pavements on the roads around Granta Park, which is shown on slide 3. And again, here, and therefore, the difficulty of the pedestrian and cycle access further discourage the use of alternative forms of transport to car use. That includes people who will be trying to travel in addition to the Granta Park bus, uh, we were trying to travel via public bus coming from the Route 13, coming from Haverhill in particular, where often in the morning the bus does not stop in the village, so people would have to walk along one of these access roads to get to Granta Park. Um, I think that is all the time that I have. So again, thank you very much for your attention. So, so could we just show page 36 of the Design and Access Statement Part 1, please? I am using my chairman's discretion to allow a little more time because we have two parish councils here. While we're looking for that, uh, Dr. Archer, can I just ask you to confirm that you have the formal consent of the parish council to, to represent them today? Yes, I do. Yes, thank you. So you're looking for one more? Yes, it's, it's this. Page, page, it's page 36, yeah. it's called View 4. And it's of the design and access statement part one. It's actually a view from just across the Granta Park roundabout. Um, Is that the one you're looking for? Um, what's the title of just above the? Yeah, that that's the, that's the one. Yes, view from the A. Yeah, right. that that shows. Um, you're well into your time limit. Can you be sum up briefly on this point, oh. please? Basically, the parish council's concerns are about the height and massing the building and the traffic consequences of the developments. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you both very much for those presentations. Um, I don't know whether we have any questions of clarification from councillors. No. So. Mr. Orgy, thank you very much, and, and Dr. Archer also. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, local member, Councillor John Batchelor, is now going to join us online. Um, are you there, John? I am indeed. Good I won't insult Councillor Batchelor by asking him if he knows the procedures. Please, the time is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm here to agree with those objecting to, to this. Uh, uh, you've heard the arguments, uh, so I won't rehearse them all again. I'd just like to say that clearly, as you've just seen in the last illustration, this building is simply too large, too imposing and too dominating. It clearly uh, has a negative impact on the surrounding countryside and the landscape character. So that is against um, policy E15. The height and scale and massing of it is, is also against policy H15. Um, perhaps I'll just bring in a new element to this. Late yesterday, we had um, a letter from the solicitors of the previous owners of uh, the land here. And they point out that when they sold in 1996, there was a whole series of legal covenants on the surrounding trees and woodlands. They are now claiming that uh, the existing uh, and, um, parking area next to this site 
is already encroaching on the woodlands and the proposed multi-storey car park would encroach further. Uh, they are um, raising the question of whether they, the, their, there exists the legal right to impose, um, to encroach into the, this woodland. They are suggesting that it's against the existing covenant and uh, I think that legal issue needs to be sorted out. Um, so I think it would be very unwise to proceed today with this application until such time as these legal matters have been dealt with. Even without that element, uh, the fact that it's against policy and the, the extraordinary size of this thing in the most prominent position possible on this on the site, then uh, I think this justifies refusal. So thank you, Chair. I think Councillor Anne Williams has a question. Um, through yourself, Chair. Um, is it um, on this particular site, if we put the covenants to one side, because I think we were advised at the beginning that that's a civil matter. Yeah. Mr. Reid is smiling at me, which means I've normally got something right. Very rare occurrence. Um, but uh, is so... In relation to the building itself, do you think that there is potential for for something of the right size in that area, or is it a, just it shouldn't be built on full stop, just about around the principle of the development issue? Well, as we heard from the first speaker, the, the master plan uh, was for this to remain a, a green area and not to be built on. Uh, if we are going to build on it, then it's, it's you know it's a simple matter. The tree line should hide it, so it can't be more than two stories high. In, in those sort of contexts, I, I would imagine that it may it may well be acceptable. Thank you. Do we have any other questions to Councillor Bachelor? I. I think at this moment we should also perhaps direct that question to officers. Um, before we start the debate, Michael, do you want to comment on that? Uh, three, which particular part of that? The, the part about it not being a development parcel? Yes. Uh, yes, there's no restrictions on the plot. It's not um, designated to remain as an area of open space. It is identified as a, a plot of land to be developed within the 1998 master plan. So there's no there's no reason something can't be placed on that site, no. Right. I think we now proceed to the debate, but before we do that, I think there may be further opportunities for clarification, including on points raised. Um, I'd like to just start off, before I go to others, asking for clarification of which master plan now applies and what its status is in terms of this application. Thank you, Chair. Um, if it's helpful, I can share a copy of the 1998 Master Plan on screen. Um, bear with me one second. And uh, the, it is summarised um, briefly in my report in paragraphs 74 to 76, but um, let me share. Chairman, sorry, could I just ask a question? Wasn't there some comment as well about the master plan of 2008? Mm. That's why I asked which master plan we were referring to. Uh, this reference doesn't state a date, I think. Perhaps you could deal with that as well. Yeah, so the, the master plan that I believe was relevant to the application is this 1998 uh, master plan, which I've got on screen here. And I'll just scroll to a few key highlights to address... Uh, points that have been raised. So this is the a plan in the, the master plan. The areas in red are in effect development parcels um, where buildings are expected to be built and you can see that that includes the uh, site one before you today. Uh, what was the 
there is information here about building guidelines. Um, again, it's drawn out in my report. So here you see another map which identifies a northern building zone, um, a northern parcel and a southern building zone. Again, site one is included within that building zone. Yes, I'm just coming to that, Councillor, apologies. Um, so obviously this is guidance, so it talks about the amount of floor space that would be expected in those northern and southern parcels, which is set out in the report. Um, prime sight lines and frontages to uh, those, those particular parcels. Um, building setbacks, building alignments, building heights, um, and that's set out in the report. Can we just stop there? Yes. Yeah, so the guide says buildings in Grants Park will be two stories unless otherwise agreed. Buildings of a greater height may be acceptable where it is appropriate to vary the silhouette or provide key landmark features subject to planning approval. And that particular element is drawn out in par between paragraph 74 and 76 of the report. So this is, this is guidance and it is acknowledged within the report. I right. can carry on through this document if you want, but... No, there, I think I that's, think that's very helpful. I don't think we need to go through the whole document. Um, and some of these are points that we will come to later, no doubt, in the debate. I think we also have a question of clarification from Councillor Rippeth. No, it was the same question same as question. you've asked. And uh, although I'd like to have some idea of how much weight we can apply to this, um, it seems quite open. Can you give us some guidance on the, the weight that we applied that particular par uh, paragraph 2.5 there? Uh, I would say it's obviously guidance for the park and then you have the local plan policies which talk about uh, scale being appropriate. Um, so you know, it does say will be two storied and typically buildings are two storied within the park, although it's probably worth noting that two storied in the context of a research and development building is not necessarily the same as a two storied residential property because the, building, the ceiling heights are higher because of the use. Um, but there are buildings on the park as existing, such as Site 6, Gilead, and the Illuminar building, which are already in excess of two storeys. Um, so as the guide highlights, it, two storeys can be exceeded uh, where acceptable. Um, right. And I would say that's when you would... You would prefer A matter for judgment for us. Yeah, as, as set out in the local plan policies, including the established employment area policy, which does make reference to landscape. So. I think Councillor Heather Williams had a point of clarification. Um, yes, mine is in relation to this document, though, Chair, so if you want to I'm check anything else there. for the document first. We have others who have questions. Anyone want to pursue this particular point in relation to this document before I come back to Richard? Dr. Richard Williams, yes. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I would just really benefit from some clarification about the status of this document. I can't find any mention of it online. I've got a planning application for this site from 2015. I can't find any mention of it there. So is this a master plan of the same type as we, you know, we look at master plans for the North East Cambridge site or whatever? Was it agreed by South Cam's District Council? I, I, I'm just unclear what, what the state of this document is. So if it helps, it's not an adopted document in the sense of being part of the development plan. It's not a, a, you know, an SPD like an affordable housing SPD. Um, my understanding is it was a, a plan uh, a, a guidance document that was devised around the um, time of the original outline permission for the site as a whole. So it's not part of our development plan, but nonetheless it, it has relevance to the site and we have had regard to it in the report. But if, if you, I don't think you could refuse the application with solely referencing the master plan. Um, you know, clearly it's, it's then the local plan policies which kick in. So it, it's of relevance, but it's, it's not part of the development plan. It's more a code for the site. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams. I'm not sure Councillor Hales had a, something on this document. His hand went up before me. So you Are you on this document, Councillor Hales? I think so. Right. Is, um, if you, so this, this is a, a, a point of clarification, if I may ask. Um, it was uh, Miss Newell who, in her presentation, made reference to the 2008, I believe, uh, master plan. I mean, are we, are we able or, or allowed to ask Ms. Newell just to clarify that and where she might have got that information from? That, I think that would be pertinent, that, that obviously with your permission.
sorry, are you addressing this question to officers or to Miss Newell, who has now completed her presentation? I, I was asking. We had an opportunity to ask her questions at the time. Yes, it, it was, but it's it's kind of come up as as as, as a, an anomaly now. Yeah. So it's just it, it kind of is, uh, something else has really his head, and Mr. Saxon has said this is a 1998 master plan, which is 20 years, give or take. Right. No, 10 years difference. Okay, Sorry. thank Maths you. Maths was a strong point. Mr. Neal, I'm going to use my chair's discretion to invite you to address that question. Are you clear what the question was, or do you want us to repeat it? How about if you rephrase it and everybody is clear? Yes. Well, thank you. I think the, the, the question is, uh, what is the, the case officer has referred to the 1998 master plan. Uh, the question is, the 2008 master plan, how do you see that as relevant and what do you see as its legal status? Thank you, thank you, thank you, members. Um, the 1998 master plan you have seen is part of the 1998 application. It and the section 106 agreement attached to that required a master plan to be set up in, in more detail. And after a number of um, renewals of the various applications, it was finally done in 2008. So that is why you have a 2008 master plan I have referred to as opposed to the document that was with the original application. Right. Mrs. Neal, thank you very much for coming back to clarify thank that you. for us. Um, just before we proceed, I would like to ask the case officer if he wants to comment further in the light of that explanation. <coughs> um, only to say that I don't have a copy of the 1990, sorry, the, the 2008 uh, master plan before me, so it's difficult for me to answer, but I'm, if, if we were able to sort of take a short recess, I, I could perhaps look through the planning history and yes. try and find it. I think so. this would be a good moment for a short recess anyway, and perhaps we can clarify this point when we return. Are you happy that we leave that for the moment, Councillor Hales? Your question. Good. Right, uh, let's come back at 
Okay, we're live again. Welcome back to South Gams District Council Planning Committee. My apologies that we extended that break a little longer, but we're live again. Just to resume where we left off, um, we had a question of clarification in relation to the master plan and the status of any 2008 master plan that was mentioned earlier on. So I'd like to go back to, is it the case or no? To, uh, Nigel Blaisley will deal with that. Uh, thank you, Chair. So we are not aware as officers of the existence of the 2008 master plan. But the third parties have referred to a document that um, they haven't seen either, um, but there is some confusion over this. Um, and we want to be clear as officers that we are pr providing you with all of the information that you need to come to a decision. So I have to tell you today that we, we, we are not certain um, we don't believe this document exists, but the third parties are adamant that such a document does exist. Neither of us can find it, um, and that leads us into a difficult position. And I suggest, therefore, that you might, may want to consider deferring the item so that we can go away and explore this further. Thank you. Well, I have... Thank you. Do we have a seconder for that? Uh, Williams, can I take that by affirmation? We don't need a vote on this. Are we all agreed on that? Yes, I think that is unanimous. Anyone take a different view? No. My apologies to all concerned for the, uh, the need to defer this, but we can only determine it if we are absolutely categorical and certain, and I'm afraid we are not at the moment. Uh, I think it would be helpful at this point to take guidance from our legal officer to speak to Stephen. Yeah. Chair, I think... Um, uh, in addition to the issue of the 2008 master plan, uh, I would like to explore with um, Mrs. Burkitt uh, their suggestion that, in fact, the covenants as to the woodland are such that the planning permission should not be granted. Uh, their client has a right to apply to the court to prevent implementation of the planning permission but it, I'm sure it would be helpful to members for them to see uh, an updated letter from Burkitt's clarifying whether, in fact, uh, they're saying that their right to apply to the court to prevent implementation would be prejudiced were you to, be, were you to consider granting planning permission in this case. OK, well, it would be helpful clearly to have that information before us when we come to look at this or an application again. Councillor Williams, did you want to add something? Councillor Heather Williams? Yes, I was, I was just going to suggest that anything else that does need to be explored on covenants, etc., is. Um, there was one thing, and just thinking of might be helpful going forward, that I was going to um, propose. It's just in relation to the references to CSET, in particular, when it comes back forward, the conditioning, because I think this might need to be consulted Sarah, on. Sorry. Um, the yeah. Okay, we're going to break off there. And come back in a, in a moment when the live stream issue is resolved.
Today, we're now going to resume. Uh, I think we can reinstate the live stream. We're going to be running some diagnostics, and if that proves to be of an unacceptable quality, we may have to come to a decision shortly. But for the moment, we're, we're okay to proceed. Now, we've just concluded item five, and just for confirmation, uh, we've just concluded item five, uh, and I know there were other, some who wanted to make further comments on item five, those comments will be noted and taken away for future consideration. I don't want to revert to item five, I'm afraid. Um, so we now move on to item six, which is land east of Highfields Road, Highfields Caldercott, uh, page 57 of your written agenda. And I think we're with uh, Michael Sexton again. Thank you, Chair. I think it's always me. Um, just by way of updates on this application, um, occupations have started on site, so there are recommended conditions within the report, conditions 18 and 20, um, which I would just seek agreement that officers, you gave delegated powers to officers to refine the wording um, to require the works to be undertaken prior to the occupation of the 25th dwelling. Um, that is to reflect the situation that residents are moving into the site and have are due to move in shortly. Um, so we would I'd just ask for, I'll show it in my presentation, how those wordings would change. Um, and following discussion with the council's legal officer, um, officers also request that if members are minded to support the application, that the delegated authority is given to officers to refine the wordings for conditions one to four, which are A to D in the report, and to include uh, wording in the deed of variation such that the section 73 application does not allow any development relating to phase two of the site to come forward in any new reserve matters application. So, uh, Thank you for that. Uh, sorry, I just want to say that we need to be able to hear clearly within the hall. So if there are the discussions that would be most grateful if they could be suspended or on. Right. Um, so the question at that point, will we, do we give delegated authority in relation to those conditions? Um, you want to come back to your main presentation on this? I don't think we need a decision on that at this stage. Thank you, Chair. I will share my screen. Um, there we go. Uh, so as will become evident as we move through, this is a site that has been before members before uh, Highfields Road, Caldicott. Um, this particular application seeks to vary conditions 18 and 20 of the original outline permission, although that was varied by a, a separate section 73, so technically it's varying that section 73. Um, but this is the, the site which is no doubt familiar, which uh, in, in 2015 there was an outline application for 140 dwellings um, on Highfields Road, Caldicott. Um, last month we considered the full application for the southern parcel, but the northern parcel, phase one, is, is under construction um, and being occupied. Um, the issue before members is that the conditions on the original permission talk about highway improvements in condition 18. Um, it's not practical to deliver those improvements on the ground. The highway is not wide enough and the land within the applicant's ownership is not wide enough. So the application is seeking to vary that original condition, as you can see at the top, which requires a shared use footway cycleway along the western side of Highfields Road, um, to the revised condition, um, which, as I mentioned in the updates, we would seek prior to occupation of the 25th dwelling, um, that the highway works are carried out in accordance with drawings that have been submitted to this application, which I will show in a moment. Um, which shows a provision of a new footpath um, in a section before it then becomes a footway cycleway. Hopefully to illustrate the issue, um, this area, sorry, this area here in, in the red box is the area uh, where the new footway cycleway is required to then extend all the way up to the, the roundabout at the top of the county court. But the area in this red box is physically not wide enough to deliver a footway cycleway, which would need to be three metres to meet standards. Um, therefore, the developer is seeking to provide a footway in that area where 
that can be provided. Um, the, foot, uh, the footway cycleway would then continue from here. So there's about 250 meter strip where the footway cycleway cannot be provided, but a footpath can be provided. And then the footway cycleway will carry on, which is why the condition is split into parts A, B, and C. Um, Highways Authority are happy with the plans that have been submitted. Ah, yeah, sorry, I have got a more zoomed in version. Um, so yes, again, this is the area where it's not wide enough to do the footway, cycle, footway cycleway, and it then becomes wide enough within the highway to deliver it. Uh, similarly, for condition 20, which requires the developer to provide a public bridleway um, to the east of the site, the land within the red line boundary has never been wide enough to provide a bridleway. County Council requirements are for bridleways to be four metres wide. Um, the land simply isn't there to be able to do so, so the developer is seeking to deliver a public footpath, um, which has a requirement of being two metres wide. So members are being asked to consider whether the provision of a public footpath rather than a public bridleway is acceptable. Um, to help with context, this is a plan from the original 106 agreement with the blue lines indicating where the new public bridleway would be, um, where an upgrade to an existing public right-of-way would be. It's worth noting that this new public right-of-way wouldn't connect to an existing public right-of-way. Um, it would connect to an existing public footpath, but as set out in the report, the land is simply not available to deliver the right-of-way as required by the condition. Um, so the principle of development has been established and indeed implemented for the, certainly for the phase one development. Um, the issues before members are the alterations to the, the shared use footway cycleway condition and the circular public right away condition. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Michael. Um, very clear. Uh, the recommendation of officers is at paragraph 117 on page 72. Do we have any questions of clarification? Yes, uh, Councillor Heather Williams and then Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Um, thank you, Chair. Through yourself, if I could just ask officers to confirm that actually, if I recall rightly, that's the, the area that they're saying isn't the space, actually is garden. There is some garden for those properties beside it. Um, so just wanted to check that that's the case. And also, forgive me if it's in the report, but... Um, the surface material that's going to be used for this footpath is what what sort of material is it going to be? Um, because that also, while it might not be a bridal way, the the surface material would um, potentially give riders the ability to use it. Thank you, Joan. Through yourself, um, yes. So the area to the west of the highway footwork, the highway improvement works, there are residential properties um, and front gardens. And the bridal way, the wording of the condition actually requires the developer to submit um, a scheme for the design and materials to be used. So the developer would still need to submit that scheme and that would be considered in consultation with the county council, who would obviously um, set out the requirements for the, the surface material required for a public footpath to meet their specifications. So, if members are minded to support the application, the developer will need to discharge condition 20 and supply those details that you've just referred to. You did this. Thank you. I'm just wondering if we're able to, so we're not able to specify ourselves that we would like it to be a natural footpath rather than a sort of tarmac one. Is it, is it possible as well to see the, the layout with the houses to see where the garden is? I'm just trying to appreciate whether it's a case of the gardens that are the issue or actually houses built on it because I'm pretty sure they could probably just remove a little bit of the gardens to make way for the to then be able to comply um, so I, is that possible just before you answer that would I be right to suggest that in this case it, that is not the aspect of the, the, the bride or footpath that we're considering we need to do we need to confine our consideration to the point you've outlined and not the, the surfacing or is that a matter we can bring in at this stage I would suggest that the surfacing is, is dealt with through the fact that the developer has to submit a discharge of conditions application, which will then need to meet the specifications of the county council and their rights of way team. Um, I don't foresee that that would be a tarmac surface um, extending across countryside. It would be a more natural footpath and one that, because it will connect into an existing public right of way, it will be one that is akin to that network and that you'd expect to see in the countryside. Um, in terms of the highway works, I can share a plan um, if that's helpful, that, that shows the position of 
existing residential properties. Bear with me. So if it helps clarify the situation, the site access is actually conveniently where this uh, boarding is shown on this photo. And then some of the footway works are Everyone to... Everyone see the pointer on there? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Some of the highway works are to extend along this western side of Highfields Road. And you can see that you then get into boundaries with residential properties, which is why there's insufficient land available to deliver that footway um, and maintain uh, the highway to the width that is required. So that is why the developer is seeking to deliver a footpath um, for this first section. And then when the land becomes available, it will then be the footway cycleway as originally required. It's just a 250 meter section where the land isn't available for a footway cycleway. Okay. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Richard Williams. Uh, <clears throat> thank, thank you, Chair. Actually, that last comment may have answered my question, but I'll ask it anyway, just to, just to, be, to be sure. So on that condition 18, I was going to ask the reason why land isn't available. Um, so presumably the answer, therefore, is because there are residential gardens that, that side. Have we seen any evidence of any attempt to acquire sufficient land, though? Through you, Chair. I did, in terms of the highway works or the bridleway? In terms of condition 18. I'm not in a position to answer that. That would be a question for the applicant, who I don't believe has attended the committee um, this week. But these discussions are the culmination of, of conversations between the developer and the highways team in terms of what is practically deliverable on site. I think that the case officer has explained to us very clearly that as things currently stand, this aspect of the conditions 18 and 20 is not practically deliverable. Uh, and I think we have to accept that for the moment. Um, I think, Councillor Henry Batchel. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question has actually been answered subsequently, so next speaker. Councillor Eileen Wilson. Then. Thank you. Um, just for clarification, um, the, the original um, condition was that there'd be footway, cycleway and bridleway. And I understand that the bridleway um, isn't possible because of the width of the road, but would it, would it still be a cycleway as well as a footpath. Um, my concern is if you have two, um, three segments of footpath, but one segment can't also be a cycleway, what happens to those cyclists if they can't continue cycling? And will they come into conflict with um, pedestrians? Through you, Jeff, I may just share a plan to hopefully clarify. Um, so I think the, the footway, cycleway, and the bridleway are two separate um, areas. So, for clarification, I use my pen here. The bridleway that's required by condition 20 um, would extend to the eastern edge of the site and in this sort of rectangle, and then come back round. Um, as you can see, the, the red line is, is very narrow. There's not four metres in width to deliver it. The footway cycleway relates to highway improvement works along Highfields Road up here. So the footway cycleway and the bridleway are two separate issues. Um, the existing situation is that, that cyclists obviously have to cycle on the road um, along this section because there isn't a, a cycleway. Um, the development will bring forward a, football, uh, a cycleway shortly after a, a roundabout down to, I forget the name of the road in Caldecott. But at, at this point here, the, the cyclists would then be able to get onto a, a cycleway, a shared footway cycleway, which then extends up to the main road, uh, main roundabout at the top of St. Neots Road. So there's still improvement works delivered. Um, it's just the cycleway can't start until slightly further north of the site. Right. If that helps. I think that's very clear. Um, do we have... Any further questions of clarification? Uh, um, anybody who hasn't so far intervened? Um, Councillor Heather Williams. I wouldn't call it an 
intervention chair, I'm more just seeking clarification. Um, it's just on my question about um, space and just on the, the comments we shown last, because when we saw the sort of garden issue that was in relation to the um, cycleway, it wasn't in relation to the, you know, with the planned for the houses in relation to why the bridal path can't fit. What I'm trying to seek is, is it a case of the land in control, the applicant could be repurposed or, you know, where the garden's going up to. Um, we're already, by putting the cycleway in that place, we're already creating a bit of a dangerous area for riders. Because essentially, if you've got a, a cycle path and the horses are on the road, you've then got the cars. And what you do is put the horse in the middle um, and it, it can cause issues. So having an alternative when you've got that going on it is, is very important to riders. So just want to see why we haven't got the space for the bridal way. So my understanding in discussions with the developer who are Linton Homes, when they acquired the site, they acquired everything that was within the red line boundary. Um, that included the strip of land that runs in a rectangle to the east of the site, um, which was not four metres wide. They have approached the adjoining landowners, um, but they are unwilling to sell the land or make the land available for Linton Homes to provide four metre wide Right away. I can't, can't confirm the reasons for that, but I can confirm that through my conversation with Lyndon, they have asked that question, but the landowner is not willing to provide or sell to them further land for the bridal way. Right. I think, think we've obtained as much clarification on this as we can. You've seen the officer recommendation at 107. Is there anybody who wants to debate the merits of this application? Or are we able to proceed to a decision on it and a determination? Council Hales. I'm not sure it's debate. Uh, please forgive me, Chair. Um, you'll tell me I can or cannot ask this question. It's something that uh, Heather Williams was asking with regards to the land. Now, uh, Mr. Saxton has answered the question about the private landowners off site, if you like. And I was, I was looking at Heather and thinking that you mentioned what about the on-site, i.e. the developer themselves giving up some of their own land to make sure this byway was big enough to do whatever it was on the, the plan without going through this condition 18. I suppose that was the question that we were driving at as a committee. Okay, if you will allow that to be asked. Yeah, I'd certainly allow that to be asked, but I think we need to clarify whether that is in relation to this particular section. Where we, the question is whether these conditions are, on current circumstances, capable of being implemented. So it may be helpful if I display to members um, what has been consented and is currently being built out on site. Um, this is the approved layout plan from the phase one development of 66 residential properties. So if a bride away were to be provided, it would only be provided around this edge here. Um, as soon as you get to this point, you can see the red land that's within the control of the applicant. The bridal way would, would cease this. The, the, the land here is not wide enough for a bridal way to be delivered. So you feasibly, you could have a bridal way for a few hundred meters, um, but it wouldn't really go anywhere. Um, my understanding is you can take horses across a public, right, uh, a public footpath, but you can't be riding on them at the time. So um, I don't think there's merit in seeking part of the uh, footpath to be um, a bridal way. I think it should. It's either all public footpath or not. Right. Um, going back again to the recommendation at paragraph one one seven, uh, the recommendation is that the planning committee grants delegated authority to officers to issue a new revised planning permission subject to the conditions set out here, and I would emphasise that that would be conditional on the completion of a deed of variation, so there will be a further stage of consideration of some of the details that have been referred to. Councillor Heather Williams again. Thank you, Chair. I've got all the clarification. Thank you to Councillor Hales as well for that one. Um, so for myself, I'm, I'm not happy in relation to the bridal way. I think even if they were giving that one section, appreciate it, it looks like you're not getting anywhere, but as you said, riders need to disembark as it were and they need to get down trying to do that on the road would be a lot more dangerous than on that section of bridal path particularly if you've got young riders they'd be able to get off and then walk through the, the footpath area so i'm not happy to relinquish them of all responsibility i think they should provide what they can 
and we should condition to say that they need to provide that bit within their control um, and then that would create at least a safer environment for um, riders um, but understand uh, with the cycle lane and the capacity there. Councillor Richard Williams. Uh, yeah, similar point, Chair. I'm, I'm not happy with either of these things. Um, I think they're already being required to provide a cycle path on land that's not under their control. It's outside the red line boundary. Um, I, I'm, I'm not really... I mean, I don't know. We're being told that land isn't available to do it with condition, but, but I, I don't know what efforts have been made to acquire land. Um, so, actually, I'm not happy to agree to either of these things. Any other views from members of the committee? Ah, oh, Councillor Deborah Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. Through you, Chairman. Um, I, I'm not going to be supporting it either. Uh, I think it's quite inexcusable. You know, these developers have lots of people who do this work for them. Did they not come to... I mean, it says at, pa at page 67, at paragraph 76... Um, seemingly they, they knew they had a problem when they bought this site but um, you know they wait till now um, to come to us and then want it changed and I'm getting more than a little sick and tired um, of developers in South Cambridgeshire um, actually always pleading that they can't do this they can't do that they can't do the other um, when they know right from the start that they have an obligation and every time they want us to buckle down to them and give in and uh, let them get away with it. I'm not doing so. Thank you, Chairman. Right. Well, I see no other hands raised. Yes, I do. How could I miss it? Councillor Jay Sale. Thank you, Chair. Uh, two points. Um, on the screen, there's a hand up on the plus six thing. And um, my question is actually in, in relation to Councillor Williams, Heather Williams, with regards to the dismounting of horses and what have you. Is there any ability? where the path comes to an end on the road, to have a wider section there where people can dismount safely. If the rest of the path, yeah, it, yeah it, whatever. Um, if that can be provided, that then does give the, the rider the, the, the chance to dismount without being on the road. That's, that's my question. If that can be a question, a question yeah, through the officers, if they can deliver that. I think, committee, it might be helpful at this moment. We have council, we have Pam Perry from the County Council as Highways Authority standing by. Perhaps we could refer these issues to him for some guidance, if you can. Um, that would be helpful. Hi, good morning, committee. Yes, very, very happy to help, particularly with the cycle path condition on Highfields Road. Um, my colleagues in highways development have, have worked very closely with the applicant to see what would be possible in terms of widening the footway to, to achieve a shared footway and cycleway on Highfields Road. Unfortunately, we cannot, we cannot ask the applicant to do work outside of the highway boundary. It's just not still compliant for us to do that or, or reasonable for us to ask that. So the applicant could only work within the, 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 the limits of the highway boundary and, and unfortunately, um, it came to light through the detailed design work, but there wasn't enough for it possible to achieve the three metre path that we were looking to achieve. So that's the reason why they're just widening the path to, to 1.8 metres to achieve a footway only. Um, it's regrettable, but it's, it's, it's the best that they can achieve at that location. So I hope that's helpful. Very helpful explanation. I think it puts uh, the decision before us in context. Councillor Batchelor. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think in light of the comments, I think we're probably in a position now to, to make a decision on this for me. Um, so I would move that we do take a vote on it, please. I think I don't see any other comments. It seems reasonable to move to a vote. Do we need to take this vote by electronically? I suspect we yeah. probably do. Unanimity. No, we clearly don't have unanimity here. So, and I think officers have noted that if we were to be inclined to refuse, uh, that I think officers have noted the reasons for those refusals. Do you need to elaborate on that? Or? Three, I suspect if members were minded to refuse, then we could 
uh, craft a reason related to policy TI2 and planning for sustainable travel, which does talk about protection and improvement of existing cycleways and walking routes. So we could have um, a reason which we would have to probably agree separately. The delegated powers to agree that with yourself, right. but I think I understand why members may seek to refuse it. Okay. Um, and if I may just remind the Chair that through my updates, we did ask the other recommendation as set out in the report to be amended slightly to include delegated powers to, to just revisit conditions one to four and include additional wording in this section 106 such that uh, there was no opportunity to come forward with a further reserve matters application, which is quite being overly robust. I think we now proceed to a vote. Um, I think the vote is in front of you on the... I think we all know how these work. If we're in favour of the officer's recommendation at 117, we press the green. If we're against, we press the, the red. So the vote is now open. Right, so that, do you want to announce that result, Owen? Uh, certainly can, Chair. Um, that is four votes in favour, six votes against, and one abstention. Right, so that is refused. Um, not quite sure that leaves us, but that, that is now refused. Thank you, Chair, if I can clarify. So that's refused, and, and as officers, we will go away and draft the reason of refusal around policy TI2, as, as uh, Michael Saxon said, and we would refer that to yourself, Chair, and Vice Chair, for your consideration. Thank you. Right. Thank you for that. That concludes um, item six. We now move to item seven. I'm very glad to welcome our Director of Joint Planning uh, to the room. Uh, so we move on to item 7, Land off Horseheath Road in Linton. This is on pages 81 and subsequent in your papers. Um, and myself, bear with me. So the applicant in this case is Crowdace Holmes. Um, Key material considerations are outstanding of surface water drainage and flood risk in this case. Um, and it's brought to the committee because the applicant, the application is one that in the opinion of officers should be determined by committee um, because of the complexity of the application. And the presenting officer in this case, I think is online, is Karen Pell Hawkins. Uh, Chair, it will probably uh, help if I uh, introduce this item you, um, and you. then pass to Karen for assistance if, if, if required. Thank you. Apologies. The floor is yours when you're, when you're ready. Second, whilst I make sure I've got the presentation up. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. This item is in front of the committee partly because of the consequences uh, of events on the 20th of July last year, 21st of July last year, when um, substantial flooding uh, arising to neighbouring properties in Lonsdale um, uh, uh, took, took place. If I can just, uh, I will share my screen with the meeting, um, if you can just bear with me one, one second. Hopefully, people, uh, members can members can see that uh, the application site um, uh, is situated uh, uh, off Horseheath Road and is a site that many members may well recall because it was a planning permission granted uh, at a point when the council didn't have a five-year land supply uh, for 42 dwellings, uh, and it was granted on appeal. Uh, condition 11 of that uh, planning uh, application. Uh, required the approval of details in accordance with a uh, uh, for surface water uh, and required it to follow uh, a set of principles set out in documents that weren't um, that weren't immediately part of that appeal but which had been submitted uh, to the council for um, uh, and the inspectorate for consideration 
the drainage proposals, um, the surface water drainage proposals uh, involve uh, several elements as set out in the, in the report. Uh, and, um, uh, but, but fundamentally um, result in uh, a um, captured surface water drainage system that leads to an infiltration basin. And you'll forgive me, uh, not the way my cursor is moving, where, my, where the arrow is uh, now. So the objective of the, um, the, the, objective of the uh, drainage system is to capture uh, and hold uh, in those um, purple areas, uh, sorry, in the pink, in the pale green areas, uh, they are permeable paving areas, but to effectively capture both the surface water from houses uh, and roofs and from the highway uh, and to convey it to this basin at the bottom left-hand corner of the site. Um, the uh, other elements of the scheme uh, include a, and I'm sorry, I'm moving around here. Other elements of the scheme include on the eastern side, a fund, uh, and on the, um, uh, and on the western side of the site, uh, a further, a further uh, raised area to, it, to reduce what is currently a situation where surface water flows um, uh, overland in peak flood events uh, from the top of the site uh, to the bottom of the site. So I'm just trying to find you the, the most appropriate slide. So there is a, an existing history of water flowing across the site from the top right-hand side of the screen to the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, and um, the site is currently uh, under construction. What happened in May last year was that um, the surface water that, that passed into the site from both the public highway passing down the uh, main site access road from a temporary site access road, which is uh, currently where that square is, um, entered into the site, uh, it conveyed substantial material, uh, filled and then overwhelmed a preliminary version of that basin uh, and then was conveyed, the water then overflowed that basin into the properties to the um, west, uh, particularly because that is the, uh, and I'll, I'll highlight that on the screen, uh, uh, inundated uh, a number of properties uh, in, in this corner. The scheme, um, uh, uh, and you have seen a number of representations that have been made both from the parish council uh, and from uh, local residents, uh, and indeed submissions that have been uh, also made uh, in the last few days, which include photographs uh, of the flood event itself. As a consequence of that um, uh, event, uh, and um, uh, notwithstanding earlier advice from the League Local Flood Authority, who are our consultees on surface water drainage schemes, um, a process of review took place. Uh, the League Local Flood Authority uh, employed consultants to review the performance of the drainage scheme that was being put forward uh, and began, a, began engagement with um, uh, the planning authority uh, and some local residents who expressed concerns and indeed still expressed concerns about some of the calculations employed about infiltration rates, but particularly uh, about the um, principles and whether the development satisfied the principles that were set out uh, as a requirement of the planning condition. That process has taken place uh, over the period since July last year uh, and has resulted in the Lead Local Flood Authority uh, and their consultants concluding that the surface water drainage scheme is now acceptable uh, and um, within the parameters for their consideration uh, against the um, Cambridgeshire Flood and Water Guidance, SPD, which they assess uh, developments of this nature. 
Now, um, notwithstanding the views of the Deep Local Flood Authority, um, you will have, uh, or you may be aware that the local MP has written to the Planning Authority this week, uh, and we have also received a further six representations from <laughs> numbers 11, 19, 31, 34, and 36 Lonsdale, uh, who were the properties largely impacted, as well as two Bakers Lane uh, in Linton that were also impacted. Uh, and they raise um, several key uh, concerns. The first is uh, that uh, the Lead Local Flood Authority have not yet published their report um, into that flood event. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, local residents uh, and um, they believe that the community at large are not able to determine uh, this proposal or comment on this proposal in light of the findings of the Lead Local Flood Authority. Um, the second um, concern that they highlight uh, is that in the drainage scheme, and indeed, um, uh, if I move to this slide, uh, there is no identified route from uh, the basin uh, in this bottom corner uh, uh, in the event that the flood event or a rainfall event exceeds the capacity of the basin. Uh, so in other words, the, um, the application suggests that that route would flow down uh, Martins Lane, which is to the immediate south, um, but the experience of local residents on the uh, event in July last year was that it flowed westwards uh, through the gardens of those uh, properties and indeed uh, into um, uh, a number of the, the properties in, the, in that area. So they've highlighted a concern around the exceedance flow uh, or the, the route for exceedance flows um, in future. Um, the Lead Local Flood Authority's view um, is that the scheme, if the, if the pond overtops, will continue to um, result in water within the site, um, but it is an acknowledged uh, within the one in 100 year plus climate change event uh, that represents the design parameters, but it is acknowledged that that route is not shown uh, in the current iteration of the scheme, and it was previously shown in an earlier iteration of the scheme uh, as flowing westwards. The, um, Third concerns that have been identified are uh, arise because the development has been um, uh, started. Indeed, a number of dwellings have been occupied uh, and a concern about whether the development itself uh, and the drainage scheme itself will be implemented or can be implemented uh, in a way that is outlined in the technical design. Um, that, um, uh, as the report makes clear, uh, there is a proposal for a post-completion testing regime, uh, but um, clearly concerns uh, have, have been expressed around that. Uh, and um, there is also uh, a, a concern uh, around the performance of the basin uh, and its infiltration rate, uh, which the Lead Local Flood Authority have tested uh, and uh, considered um, in some in some depth uh, over recent uh, re over recent months. The final um, concern relates to whether or not the fund and there is a bund proposed. And I'm sorry to move you around on this drawing. There is a bund proposed uh, along this eastern side edge and along the allotments to prevent water flowing, which would naturally flow in this direction, flowing onto the site uh, in, in future. The, um, uh, you may hear concerns this morning uh, that this fund, shown in green on this plan, uh, has not been formed at this moment in time uh, and um, uh, is currently in the location of uh, some landscaping works that have been carried out the, the, uh, and uh, a concern that the, there is not sufficient land 
from, in the applicant's control to be able to deliver that fund. What you see here, this drawing here, is uh, a phasing plan referred to in the uh, committee report, which identifies uh, areas of works that will need to take place, which are referred to uh, in the report, including the um, formation of this fund along the eastern edge, uh, including alterations to the site to address the gradient and the ability of the site access road at the moment to, to prevent water flowing down it from Horsey Road, uh, which require further works, uh, and the um, uh, completion uh, and um, implementation in full of the works for the infiltration basin uh, in the um, bottom corner of the site, which has not yet been uh, constructed uh, and completed, completed fully. So um, the local MP has requested um, that the council defer the item and local residents' representations requested that the council defer the item. Um, from an officer perspective, we've been advised by the Lead Local Flood Authority and their consultants throughout this process. Uh, the Lead Local Flood Authority are responsible for producing the uh, report based on the findings of the events in um, July last year uh, and are satisfied that the proposed drainage scheme accords with their um, uh, requirements for um, surface water drainage schemes in terms of design uh, and uh, overall performance, uh, although um, they have not yet shared the report uh, of the uh, flood event with the planning authority uh, either. Chair, I think I'll probably stop there and allow yes. for questions. Yes, I think we should proceed to questions now rather than later in the debate. Um, can I just check that the recommend, officer's recommendation is still as at paragraph 49? in view of the fact that we do not have the, the full report available to us as yet? The, 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 um, the report, the Section 19 report is not a planning report, and it's not a report within the gift of the planning authority. Um, our view is that given the report is prepared by the Lead Local Flood Authority, uh, and um, the Lead Local Flood Authority are the consultees that we've worked extensively with over the last... Uh, 10 months especially since the unfortunate flood event, that there isn't a reason from an officer perspective to um, uh, defer consideration for that. So the recommendation matter. is the same. The recommendation right. We have some approved. questions to you, which you may choose to bring in the senior planning officer as well. Um, I'd like to start with Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. And it's probably more of a suggestion than a, than a question. Um, just around the the report, I suppose there is potentially a question there of when we're expecting this report to become public. Um, but equally, and I do understand, you know, officers are telling us what we can do um, and what we could do. But sometimes as councillors, our decision is to decide, yes, we can, but should we? Um, and I think that's an important distinction. Should we be looking at this until we've seen that report? Um, in our judgment, which I have to say, I think many of us would feel more comfortable if we did have that report. And also, we are here for public interest. That's why it comes to committee. Um, so I can understand why residents would be very nervous at the moment and would want to see it. So when can we expect it to be public, I think is my question. Um, and Chair, I, I am more inclined to, um, to suggest deferral until that has been made public, just in case yes, you want to know so we don't carry on unnecessarily. Just to clarify, at the moment that we're dealing with questions of clarification for officers, we will have an opportunity to have a debate later on. But, Mr Kelly, would you like to address that question? My understanding is that a draft report is um, prepared, but it has not yet been finalised by the local flood authority and shared with us. When I've inquired about the report, uh, the League Local Flood Authority have said um, it is a matter of weeks in which it could be made available, but it isn't yet um, gone through their approval and sign-off process. Yes. Uh, yes, I think there are others who want to ask questions and then perhaps we'll come back to it. Also, I think it would, as a matter of courtesy, make sense to 
hear from the, uh, the public speakers we have lined up. Um, I'll take an officer recommendation on that in a minute. But in the meanwhile, we have a question from Councillor Batchelor. Thank you, Chair. Um, just two questions of clarification around two of the um, local concerns that have been raised that you referenced in your introduction, Stephen. Um, one, so the lack of information on the exceedance flow, i.e. where the water will flow if the, uh, if the, infiltra if the filtration basin is full. Um, yeah, so I, so I just want some clarity around um, what do, sorry, what am I trying to say? So what, when do we, we think we might have that information? Because clearly that will be of some comfort to, um, to members, uh, to local residents who live in the estates surrounding the new development. And second one, um, there was also a concern around the proposed buns on the northeast side of the site. Um, I know there was a concern about land ownership and not actually being able to fully uh, build these out as designs, given the fact that the, the land in question isn't in the ownership of the applicant. So, yes, yeah, so just two points of clarity around those. Uh, thank you. Uh, in terms of the um, exceedance flow route, uh, the representations um, have highlighted, uh, and indeed earlier iterations of the um, flood risk uh, or the, the surface water management scheme included. Um, an indication that the exceedance flow would be westwards, as I said. The report, however, from the um, applicants um, implies that the exceedance flow will be southwards down Martins Lane. Um, the events in May, in July last year, nevertheless, um, uh, didn't support the suggestion that the exceedance would be down Martins Lane um, because um, it, uh, the waters in themselves flowed westwards. There is no current detail on the application around that, although there has been discussion with the lead local flood authority. Uh, and for the design um, year exceedance, um, uh, in terms of the performance of the basin, um, the applicants have been clear that it stays within the site, doesn't leave the site, but we don't have uh, details beyond that in terms of where the exceedance flow would, would uh, take place. The suggestion, and I think local concern on this, is that it would be westwards into Lonsdale rather than down mm. Martins Lane. Um, uh, that information isn't information that's contained within the current applications, um, but uh, if the committee were minded, it certainly is something that could be sought, I suspect, relatively quickly. Um, in terms of the uh, information around the buns, um, this has been a point that's been raised with the, um, uh, with the applicants. They believe that they can um, form those buns, and there's a core to the, to, the, to the buns as well, within the land that they control. Um, we have not, as officers, been out to survey the land in detail. I'm aware that uh, third parties have undertaken some preliminary assessments in which they feel that the drainage uh, ditch part or the ditch in front of the bund cannot be accommodated within the application site. Um, when we've challenged the applicants on this, their um, view is that that area, uh, that the ditch can be formed, but I haven't, um, I haven't got a survey to confirm the details of that in front of you today, sorry. Well, we will come back to an opportunity for questions before we have the debate at the end. And we do have some speakers uh, lined up to speak to us. So I would like to move on to that quite quickly, but we have um, firstly Councillor Deborah Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. I'll keep it very, very short. Can you just tell me, please, Mr. Kelly, uh, was the, um, the lead authority, the flood lead authority, were they aware that it was coming to committee today? And uh, if they did, why didn't they actually hurry it up and, and get it through to us, if you know that. Thank you. I can't answer the, the process, unfortunately, behind the LLFA. They're aware of the concern around the Section 19 report, and local residents have asked that question too. Councillor Khan. <laughs> you think a bit of information about the geology of the area. Uh, I'm presuming that it's based on, it, it's, it's covered by boulder clay, or perhaps clay with flints, but more likely boulder clay. Uh, I'm just wondering what depth there is and whether the infiltration pond goes right through the boulder clay to the chalk underneath. Um, exactly. Uh, and how, in that case, they will put 
prevent uh, clay being washed down and sealing the bottom of the pond um, in flood events. Chair, if it's, if it's helpful, um, uh, you're, you're correct, Councillor Khan. Um, the calculations and the assessment of the performance of the infiltration pond is something that the big local flood authority have um, scrutinised quite carefully. I'm conscious that uh, Hilary Ellis from the Lead Local Flood Authority is um, uh, in this meeting uh, and available um, potentially to answer that question. That would be very helpful, thank you. Mr Ellis, are you... Hilary Ellis, are you, are you there? Are you able to I'm, answer that? Yeah, I'm here, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, in terms of the geology, there have been a two different sets of infiltration testing undertaken by the developer. So they did some as part of the outline application and then later on as well, we requested further testing to demonstrate that the, the ground is suitable for infiltration. Um, also, what they have uh, offered is to do some further testing if and when the site is finally approved, uh, once the basin is constructed to kind of demonstrate that it, that it does work. If that testing found that it didn't work, they would have to then seek an alternative solution or look to kind of adapt the system somehow. Um, and in terms of the uh, effect on the basin of a flood event, they have submitted a maintenance plan, which includes actions to take after any kind of flood event to, to clear out the basin and make sure it's clear of any debris. Thank you for that. Uh, then proceed to Councillor Hales. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, Mr Kelly, you, you, you said in your, your uh, presentation that it's accepted that the water runs to the west. Yeah. And that the the, um, the resident said, no, it doesn't. In the flood, it ran south, and then hence flooded the gardens and what have you, and the properties. I seem to remember on the previous applications last week or last month, whenever it was, that there was technical information that said when water flows, it can be underground, i.e., it flows underground. And is that what the applicant is referring to when it, it flows west? Because we wouldn't see it. But when we have a flood event, does it actually flow south? Which would be much more of a worry, if you like, than what goes west. Thanks. Just before you answer that, can I, it, it, you just rip if I have you next? Is your question related to that? It might be possible to deal with both at the same time, or is yours a different question? Um, it's slightly different. Okay. Just to, just to clarify, and I'm sorry if it wasn't wasn't clear. The the, um, the applicant's information suggests that water flows southwards into what's called Martin's Lane, although it's, the Martin's Lane doesn't connect to the application site. The experience of local residents, and indeed um, the indication from the Environment Agency's own uh, data, suggests that the water flows effectively diagonally across the site. Uh, and certainly the experience of residents in Lonsdale was that in the recent flood event that we referred to, which was a substantially greater flood event than one in 100 years, which is the design year for the, for the, for the scheme uh, in terms of rainfall intensity and so on, um, was that it flowed westwards um, over the boundary into the gardens of homes in Lonsdale and then through the lower part of Lonsdale, uh, continued westwards and then ended up in uh, Baker's Lane. Uh, I think Councillor Hales wanted to follow up on that. Yeah, so sorry, I just got me west and me south the wrong way round. But essentially, though, the, my question really was about where, where the experts say the water generally flows. Is that underground or above ground? But we know from the pictures that the flood water was across the ground and it went in a different direction. So it's that point of clarification. Do we have the confidence that the people giving us the information are giving us the correct information, i.e. above or below ground. I think the predominant in peak rainfall conditions is that it flows over ground and that it flows westwards. Um, I don't know whether um, Hilary Ellis is able to uh, comment on this point. Yeah, no, thanks, Stephen. I, I agree with you there, yeah. There'll be the but definitely water can flow above ground and underground, but in the events that we saw in July, if they were to be repeated, it is mo most likely that that water would flow over land. So I have a question from Councillor Judith Griffith. Before I take that, 
If there are others considering questions, can I just remind you we have speakers lined up to, uh, to speak to us, and you may want to consider whether to put your further questions later. Um, Councillor Ripon. It was a clarification one. Um, I thought you'd seen my hand earlier. Um, this isn't directly flooding drainage, but how many properties are occupied already? Um, is the sort of effect of the time we've got is kind of quite short. Um, I'm quite surprised. Um, how many are um, occupied already? And I'm assuming they're at the northern part of the site. If you could just give that information. So my understanding um, is that there are seven properties that have been occupied. Um, uh, that arises from, um, there was a transfer to Bedfordshire Pilgrims of some homes and there was a single home sold. It is slightly surprising that those occupations happened despite the failure for the council to approve the planning condition at this moment in time. Um, that's a matter that um, falls outside of um, uh, the consideration of the merits of the scheme. We have, though, as you can see from the report, recognising the concern that a number of people have highlighted that, in fact, the scheme is partly implemented. Um, we've sought uh, information, which I showed you in the drawing, um, about what works would take place in the event of approval of the scheme, because it's not yet completed on the site. So the surface water drain scheme has not yet been fully implemented. Uh, on the site and there um, are concerns that I highlighted in the representations that the landscaping works that have been carried out would in fact need to be replaced as a consequence of the needs to form particularly the fund on the eastern site boundary uh, where there is a line of trees planted uh, and um, shrubs planted at this moment in time. Okay I suppose it was just really um, a question of grave concern thank you. Councillor Harvey, did you want to ask a question at this stage or do you want to come back later? Yes, if I may. Um, just uh, do, do, do any of the um, expert bodies um, involved in this have a view, do we think, on... I mean, given that we know that water uh, historically flows west and that the recent sort of flood event was sort of, um, I think we just said... Um, above the 100-year event, I mean, would, would the flooding have occurred had the development not been there, had it been um, the original uh, meadow, I, I guess? Chair, can I, uh, I'm, not, um, I'm not qualified effectively to answer that question. Um, what I can say is that the um, environment agencies flood maps um, would tend to suggest that there is a flow of water uh, across the uh, site from east to west of varying depth and certain levels of um, significance. Um, but I don't know whether Hilary Ellis from the Leeds Local Flood Authority can offer a, a view on this. The events on, um, in July last year were substantially, um, uh, uh, they were significant in terms of um, exceeding the design uh, year, um, but perhaps um, Hilary Ellis can comment. Thanks very much. Um, this will be contained in, in our report and then I appreciate, you know, it, it, we haven't issued it yet, but we do plan to do that in the, in the next few weeks. Um, depending on the type of rainfall data that, that we've looked at, the, the event that happened in July was, in, it's, depending on whether we look at rainfall, data from a radar or from a rain gauge it was between a one in 200 year and a one in 600 year rainfall event which is you know an exceedance of anything that the site would be designed for um the properties of, of that in lonsdale a number of them are already shown to be at, at high risk of surface water flooding in and in some cases in a what we call a one in 30 year event which is a more frequent event we would expect to see some flooding of those properties um, but yet there is a, a flow path shown across the site and the flood investigation that we've undertaken um, hasn't found that the development itself caused the flooding. Um, you know, it did play a part in it, but we would expect of a rainfall, if we saw that again, uh, that some flooding would have been expected. Thank you. All right. Um, Heather Williams, a new point. Um, okay, further, further question at the stage, please. Thank you, Chair. It's, it's a 
a new question based on what Councillor Ripper said about occupation. Um, so these, these sorts of things normally have to get sorted before occupation um, and you can't normally get a mortgage <laughs> unless um, planning permissions are discharged or there's, there's some form of confirmation. So Chair, through yourself, I'm just clarifying the council's not had to go down that route and give confirmation pre-mortgage, has it? Uh, we don't know the arrangements under which the properties were purchased, but clearly you would expect the due diligence of any purchaser to include considering whether or not the um, development was in accordance with the um, planning permission. Right. So we've not had to give assurances on anything? We, we haven't given any assurances on, um, on that issue. So not a matter for us, I think. I think that concludes the officer presentation. I'd now like to uh, invite our speakers on this, uh, starting, I think, with John Wood, who's joined us virtually, I think. Are you there, Mr Wood? Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon. You have three minutes to present your case, and if you would stand by for any uh, questions that members may raise with you after that. Please, go ahead. Of course, I believe there should be some slides to show as well. Do we know what slides you want to show? I, I'm not sure that we do. Uh, they were submitted uh, last Friday to Democratic Services. Is available? Chair, I, I think I have a copy of the slides. If you can just bear with me one, one second. I wasn't um, certain of the arrangements. We'll do you in a minute. Well. I will send those to you now as well, Stephen. They were, yes, they were sent to Lawrence, that's correct. Yeah, my apologies, Mr Wood. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Lawrence, who, to whom you sent those, is not is ill and is not here okay. today, so we just got to transfer them and we will have them up for you in a minute and then you can start That's great, thank you very much. I will, um, I, I have them here as well, so I'll send them to Mr Kelly now, just in case. Hi, I've got a copy of the slides, if you'd like me to show uh, them. Yes, please, Karen. Yeah, okay, bear with me. Thank you. Can you see those? Yeah, I can see those. Thanks, Karen. Great. Good to go. Okay, um, perhaps you'd like to proceed with your presentation. Lovely. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, councillors, for allowing me to speak today. Um, you'll be well aware that we are seeking rejection or deferral of this application on the basis that we do not believe that it complies with policy CCA to the local plan, in particular in relation to the requirements set out in the flood and surface water SPD for exceedance flow routes. We do not know why uh, unprecedented flooding occurred on 20th of July last year, as the Section 19 report has not yet been published, uh, despite being promised in a matter of weeks in October. Uh, we don't know what the exceedance flow route would be in the event of rainfall exceeding the design and we don't know whether the applicant owns land that they are presenting will be used as part of drainage features. Uh, these are matters of disclosure uh, which must be known by the LLFA and the applicant uh, and we would like to see these disclosed prior to consultation and why we are seeking deferral. Next slide please. Uh, this is what the infiltration basin on the applicant application site looked like on 20th of July last year and the second photo shows flood water that had exceeded the basin flowing into Lonsdale. Next slide please. Uh, and the first and three of these doorbell images are taken just 17, sorry, Karen, one up, please, uh, are taken just 17 minutes apart. So the most staggering thing about this event is that we went from nothing to submersion in such a short space of time. Uh, in the absence of the Section 19 report, we do not know why. Next slide, please, Karen. Uh, this is the location of the basin in relation to neighbouring properties. Seven houses in Lonsdale were flooded, three in Bacon's Lane were flooded, uh, and we don't know how many others downstream were flooded also. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is what our lounge looked like on 20th of July. At the highest level on our property, uh, the depth of the water reached 80 centimetres there on the front elevation. Our two-year-old daughter was barely taller than that, so she could have been submerged. The SPD Clause 5.2.1 states that management measures are no longer about reducing the risk, but about planning for flooding. Paragraph 29 of your report does state that the site will reduce the flood risk to surrounding areas, but do we need to be planning for this level of flooding again? 
The report also cites consideration by the courts that expectations that development remove all existing flood risk cannot be achieved. And I should be absolutely clear that this is not what we are seeking. I, my neighbours, and in fact, any of the Linton residents that live south of this site uh, need to be able to plan and understand any flooding that will occur. We've been told anecdotally by the Director of Planning, and as you have heard today, that the rainfall event on 20th of July was a one in 500 year event, well in excess of that which has been modelled and designed for. So this is not a theoretical exercise for neighbouring residents. There is precedent of rainfall that exceeds the design. There is precedent for exceedance from the basin. And unfortunately, it's totally unreasonable that we have only heard some of this information from the LLFA today, despite having requested the report on multiple, um, uh, multiple occasions in the past. Next slide, please, Karen. So the applicant does state in Appendix J of their submitted drainage strategy that in the unlikely event that flooding does occur, flows will not pose, pose any risk to the existing residents off the southwest of the site. Any water will flow down Martins Lane onto Bartlow Road. Recognise in earlier revision C on the left, Appendix A of the drainage strategy put before you today, but now removed on the right. So Appendix A and Appendix J are now in contradiction. Why was it removed? Why did the water flow to the southwest on the 20th of July? What would the exceedance flow route be today? The applicant will tell you that the implementation of the design was incomplete on the 20th, but this does not negate the requirement for exceedance routes to be known. Uh, approval of this application as submitted would actually be creating material Mr. Wood, could you bring your uh, presentation to a conclusion? Of course, yeah, in contradiction on the record. Uh, in addition, the design has never indicated in any revision that water would go to the west, contrary to the presentation and any consultation. Next slide, please. The application allegedly provides 300 millimetres of freeboard in the basin for storm events over and above that design for. That's an arbitrary figure that has not been modelled. The image on the right shows the modelling of how the basin will look in the most extreme design for event. What is the exceedance flow route and in what storm event will it be utilised? Until such time, the Section 19 report has been published and exceedance flow route shown. No reasonable view can be taken on whether the site increases, reduces or maintains flood risk to the surrounding area. Finally, next slide please. Finally, the most recent submission by the applicants on the right shows that half of the drainage ditch on the lower corner of the eastern boundary extends into the adjoining field, outside the area upon which outline planning is granted, and in variation to the reserve matters approval. Does the applicant own this land? How will this ditch be maintained in perpetuity? And very finally, this submission appears to have been received by the LLFA after the conclusions presented and reported by their consultants. Has this matter of land ownership and components of the drainage solution been considered by the peer review? In addition, the conclusions presented by the LLFA consultant states that all previously raised matters have been addressed. We do not agree that our matters raised have been addressed as we have set out uh, and we have previously made this very clear to both the LPA and the LLFA. Uh, Chair Councillors, thank you. Mr Wood, thank you very much indeed. That was very clear and uh, you could probably see the expressions on some of the councillors' faces reaction to the photographs you showed but uh, I hope I, I wish I had <laughs> um, we take what you say extremely seriously uh, there may be one or two questions of clarification for you if you would uh, firstly I think from Councillor Hales thank you chair Mr Woods thank you um, your presentation was probably 0 to 70 rather than 0 to 60 so I only great got parts of it. Um, I'm assuming we've got Mr. Wood's presentation and the photographs in document form because um, I would really like to see that and the, the, the technical detail that Mr. Woods gave. Uh, frankly, I could listen to Mr. Woods slowly for the next half hour, right? Um, I, I really mean... Unfortunately, as chair, I'm afraid we're I not going to allow that. I know, carry I on. know. So uh, the photographs speak a thousand words. Frankly, so um, it was the bit, the bit where you had the mauve, the mauve direction of flow into the into the pond, is the bit that concerns me the most. Could you just go over that bit again? Of course. If, Karen, would you go to bring the slides up again, please? Is it possible to do it without the slides? I, I, I can I can try. So um, yes, uh, maybe we can try and try and bring them up. You know, so, so this shows the difference between two revisions that have been submitted for this drainage strategy. Okay. Our, our complete point about all of this is we need to be able to know and understand. It's further down, please, Karen. We need to be able to know and understand where this water is going to go if it happens again. Um, we need to be able to plan for flood resilience or um, flood resistance. We need to be able to invest in our property uh, and make sure to protect my family. So the earlier revision, uh, and actually supported by FRAs that have been submitted in relation to this site, show that any exceedance flow will go down Martins Lane to the south, uh, as I say, as supported by FRAs as well. Um, that is what the applicant stated in this earlier revision. 
um, I believe was part of the previous submission for this uh, for, for the drain surface drainage system on this site. Uh, and then the image to the right is the is taken from the current drainage strategy as submitted for your consideration today. So in the past, the applicant has said that the water will go south. But as we know, unfortunately, on the 20th of July, it came to the west. And we need to know which way it's going to go if it happens again. As I say, there is now precedent for rainfall outside of the design events, and there is now precedent of water coming our way. Um, so that's what we're trying to understand. And we we would like to feel that this is not unreasonable for you as councillors to also want to understand that uh, when being asked to discharge this. It is information that we believe from interpretation of the SPD is required to show exceedance flow routes in the event of uh, rainfall events that exceed the design, and they should be known and appropriate. The fact that the application itself is contradictory to itself in, in two appendices, plus it's contradictory to in the past to what happened on the 20th of July, to us means that the information has not been presented to you for you to be able to be consider, for you to be able to consider this application properly. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Howells wants to come back. Um, through you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Wood. It's really a question, if I may, to Mr Kelly, with regards to the, the, the two slides there that Mr Wood has up on the screen. Um, I'm, I'm a little confused. The, the implication from Mr Woods is that the information provided originally would have been on the left saying, well, this was all fine and dandy, but actually what happened or what's going to happen now is it's going to be the right hand one. But history tells us that's not necessarily so. Could you explain those two slides to us and their submission or who provided them, et cetera, et cetera? Thanks. So these are extracts from the um, surface water drainage strategy documents, but they are not the same. Uh, they're similar extracts from different documents. So the one on the left hand side is an earlier iteration of the um, surface water drainage strategy document. Uh, and the one on the right hand side is the one before the council at this moment in time. Obviously, there are some uh, differences that have um, accompanied that uh, over the passing of time. But Mr. Woods is correct that the implication is, is that the surface water, where it exceeds the capacity of the site effectively, would then traverse southwards onto Martins Lane. And he's included in that slide the extract from the statement on that. I think the point he's making is there are no arrows to indicate whether that is the situation um, and residents experience um, is not that surface water travelled down Martins Lane in July when there was an exceedance event. The applicants um, and the LLFA have considered the matter of exceedance in some uh, depth uh, and um, believe that the scheme is contained within the site. What Mr Woods, I think, is raising is even uh, in the event of an, uh, of an even greater event than the design specification, where would the water go? And at this moment in time, the application doesn't show that. Right. Uh, just to remind members, we're up on Mr. Wood's presentation still. Uh, so any questions of clarification to Mr. Wood from Councillor Roberts, I think is next. Thank you, Chairman. And through you, Chairman, good afternoon, Mr. Woods. Let me firstly say, um, I am so grateful that you have made this presentation to us this morning and the fact that it's a detailed presentation and it's also about personal experience uh, and I'm sure that every one of us in this room was actually quite horrified at what had occurred in your own property. Can you tell me, I, I, I think you did give some indication, but clearly from what we could see of the photograph of your lounge, uh, all the furniture was a flood. You obviously have not had time to um, get it anywhere near safety or propped up or anything. Can you just remind us, please, uh, how quickly your house went from being dry to being flooded with that amount of water? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Karen, if it would be okay to just scroll up a couple of slides, please. Uh, and one more um, to the doorbell photos. That's the one, thank you. 
uh, just down one, please. So uh, this demo, this is from our, our doorbell. Um, the, the first image was taken at 1635. Uh, the next one to the right at 1645 and the one in the bottom left corner at 1652. So there were 17 minutes from uh, from nothing to everything. Uh, and you can see the image to the to the bottom right hand corner there. It was like a weir. Uh, basically traveling wherever it could. Um, my sister-in-law was almost taken off her feet by this, um, and I was going to say to you previously anyway, uh, that she would not appreciate me uh, telling you that she's in her 40s, so what chance would my daughter have had, who's, who's only was only two at the time? Um, so at the highest point, yes, it was 0 0.8 meters high. Um, downstairs throughout was completely flooded. Uh, we are in temporary accommodation um, and have been in temporary accommodation um, for the past seven months since, since this happened. Um, and our concern is we have this basin looming over us um, and, and as I tried to say in the presentation this is not about removal of the risk for residents it doesn't matter if you live on Lonsdale or on Baker's Lane or Martin's Lane of course as well this, this is unprecedented this flooding and I'm, I'm fully aware that the environment agency maps do show water coming across from that direction um, but it is unprecedented it's never happened before um, from that direction and we just want clarity about exactly what would be happening. <laughs> Mr Wood, thank you very much for your presentation. That was very clear. And as you could tell, um, we were all very concerned about what you described to us. I'm now going to move on and invite uh, Matthew Harmsworth, who's the senior planner for Barton Wilmore to speak on behalf of the applicants. Are you with us, Mr. Armsworth? I am indeed. Can uh, you hear me? I think we can hear you clearly. You have three minutes. Thank you. I wish to start by commending the high level of detail provided through the officer report and noting the extensive discussions that have taken place to put together what is a rigorous scheme for surface water drainage at the site. The surface water drainage scheme for the site has been extensively reviewed and is considered acceptable by all technical consultees, in addition to a full independent peer review by CAPITA. The outline condition requires approval of a surface water management scheme that reflects the principles within the Thomas Consulting sur Surface Water Drainage Strategy referenced therein. A comprehensive suite of information has been produced which accords with the principles of the Thomas report and measures are confirmed for regular maintenance and management of the scheme as shown within the documents referenced within paragraph 49 of the officer report, including mitigation against flood events. The officer report comes to the same conclusion as supported by technical consultees and thus simply put, the scheme does exactly what's required by the condition. On top of this, the applicant has stated that they will commit to a post implementation assessment and monitoring of the scheme with particular attention to works along the western boundary, thus giving additional comfort to the authority and to local people regarding implementation of measures proposed. Regarding recently reported incidents of flooding, it would be invalid to conclude on the basis of these that the surface water drainage scheme is inadequate, given that the drainage scheme has not yet been fully implemented. Furthermore, as referenced within the site suite of evidence and the officer report, appropriate mitigation is outlined for flood events consistent with what's required through policy. As made reference to by the inspector in November 2021, in the case of another Linton site, such drainage conditions require that the drainage scheme perform to a level that the development would not result in an increase in flood risk either on the site or elsewhere. What the scheme is not required to do is to resolve existing flood issues observed historically, generally in Linton. As a point of clarity, please also note that the technical consultees have previously clarified that the foul and surface water drainage systems in Linton are two separate systems. It's therefore considered that the approach to surface water drainage is not only acceptable, but as noted by the LLFA, a factor safety of 10 is demonstrated, which they state is above and beyond what would typically be seen for a residential site. It's therefore in the clear interest of the committee to approve the scheme without delay to allow the surface water drainage scheme measures to be implemented to mitigate appropriately against potential future flood events. Therefore, we respectfully request that the condition be discharged, allowing the developer to move closer towards delivering this and the wider development approved for the site. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Hunsworth, and dead on time. Um, yes, we have one or two questions for you, if you would. Uh, firstly, from Councillor Deborah Roberts. Thank you, Chairman, and through you, Chairman. Um, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Hemsworth. Um, you, I'm sure, have just seen the same things that we have just seen, and the, what in my opinion is, my personal opinion is, horrific uh, pictures uh, of flooding. You appear to be trying to say, well, oh, what's happened in the past, nothing to do with us. Um, you, as a planning authority, need to give us uh, approval for what's in front of you now. However, you've already started on this site, haven't you? you I think it was said that you've already got eight um, dwellings uh, actually occupied on this site. And one of the things that concerns me is I think that the majority of them were social housing um, and therefore people who maybe won't be so well insured, etc. So um, can you explain to me why you think that um, the problems of only eight months ago uh, are nothing to do with you now? If I can, if I can clarify the point, point, points on that, um, I mean, clearly we, uh, it's on a, it's in Crowdace's clear interest to make sure that you know those kind of events don't happen again. We express sympathy for uh, sympathy for those. We don't dis don't disregard them. Um, on the point, I guess regarding um, a, there was a lot of discussion earlier regarding the flows going west. Why is there a discrepancy between the two drawings? If I could clarify that point, and hopefully it helps with um, what you're asking about now. Um, the reason for the discrepancy between the true drawings is the original one that there was on the left was before the, um, the scheme was altered so that there was a there would be a bund on the southern side of the infiltration basin to direct flows back into the deten detention basin so that things will be contained on the site that's why it doesn't have the arrow showing going south from there now so clearly we've we've recognized that there have been issues yes policy requires us to mitigate it in against one in 100 year events but we recognize the issues we've tried to uh, we've tried to work with the llfa and with officers to make sure that not only like i say that do we mitigate against what what policy requires us but where we need to and where there's been where there's been a need um, that we go that we go and above and beyond measures like the uh, measures like the bonding which I mentioned um, are intended for that purpose so in short we do recognize uh, um, uh, resident need we do what recognize what's happened in the past my point was merely recognizing what's required by policy and what we're doing in actual fact um, on the site hopefully hopefully that clarifies the point Councillor Harvey. Uh, yes, um, thank you, Chair. Through you. Um, well, having seen the, the photos that Mr. Wood uh, presented, it seems to me that's obvious that um, the effect of the um, built, um, as, as far as it has been built, um, addition to, to what was there before um, any construction com commenced, has been the rapidity of the water flow um, ending up in the um, southwest corner. Um, and therefore, I wonder, I, I mean, on, on page 85 of our agenda pack, it talks about this um, 10 to 1 safety factor. But I believe that applies to the infiltration rate and the tendency of um, capture ponds to silt up if you like so the infiltration rate um, might might be reduced by a factor of 10 over time but surely what what we've seen uh, view of the pictures we were shown is is not the um, flow capture that being important but the volume capture and i wondered is this basin intended to be a, a, a wet detention basin or a dry detention basin and and and, and in, if it's the uh, former um how are you guaranteeing the available volume to capture water that's arriving within a matter of minutes rather than percolating? 
Yeah, th thank you for the question. In, in a sense, I think um, regarding um, technical comments uh, like in infiltration, I think Hillary Ellis would be uh, probably well better placed with her engineering knowledge than me to to answer that sort of thing. Um, so. I would refer to her in in a, in a sense there, um, and the discussions they've had direct with with Crowdace themselves. Um, what I can what I can say is 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 clearly re re reiterate the point, express express sympathy, and clearly it's extremely unfortunate uh, what's happened historically with with flood of, flood events. We don't we don't disregard it, and we've we've really tried to work here through the last last few months to make sure that we are providing not only the level of detail I've observed for what would typically be discharged for other surface water drainage conditions, but making sure we're really rigorous on all the micro drainage calculations and whatever um, the LLFA have asked for um, and the peer review has asked for, we have see, we have sought to provide it. And as I say, um, as hopefully it, hopefully it doesn't come across the wrong way, um, I, I reiterate the point that had we had this been um, implemented at, at an earlier point, and I don't fault South, Cam South Cambridgeshire for being rigorous on this or anyone else for you know asking the right questions. The timing is clearly extremely unfortunate. That yes, Crowdace accept the point started a, started early on, started early on site. Historically, there are flows east to west. Who can say whether um, what would been what have been what would have been the result of um, what the um, flows would have been had they not started on site? We we are where we are. I don't I don't say that call callously. I just say that as as the position that we're in. Um, that clearly we're trying to resolve this as soon as possible, and that as much as anything in not wanting residents to be put out to be put out again or anything this to happen, is why we're wanting. To be able to proceed with things further sooner rather than later on these on these surface water measures. Thank you for that response. Uh, I have three more questions for you, but just to note that you referred, you said that uh, um, the LFA might be in a better position to answer one question that was put to you. Now we'll come back to that later, if we may. I don't want to go to anyone else at the moment, so we'll stick with you. Um, and I have a further question from Councillor Hales. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Mr. Hargreth. Um, if I recall, you said earlier that you, you were respectfully asked the committee to approve this application so that you could get on and do the flood defences and, and what have you for the site. And yet my colleague, Councillor Roberts, says, and, and I think it was also mentioned earlier, that there are a number of properties already um, occupied on the site regardless of their tenure, but these are people living on your site. So I would have probably wagered that those flood defences should have been done at the start before anybody was allowed to live there. So may I respectfully say that was a error of judgment on your part. Do you have a question, part. Councillor Hale? I do, Chair. Um, on the plan that has the yellow road going down the middle, and what have you, and the three arrows, which is the one in the in the, the uh, submitted report. The bung, I think is it the, the L-shaped bung, Mr. Kelly, I don't know what direction that is, but the L-shaped bung to the top right of your plan that doesn't exist at, mo at the moment, which is where all the water allegedly came from. Yeah, um, why, why was that not um, implemented and put in if you believe a, a bung should be there to protect the site when you've got people living on site. And also, when you, when you come to answer that, that, that bung is L-shaped, but it stops at the top of the, I believe those to be allotments. And what is there to stop the water coming round the end of that bung and just coming across the site anyway? There is nothing that stops it from what I can see here. Um, moving perhaps slightly further down the site, but still coming westwards or southwards, whatever it is, across the site. Thank you. Are you able to help us with that? Yeah, yeah. would it be helpful perhaps if we could put the planning question on, um, on screen, um, if anybody has that available? Yes, we're just looking that out at the moment and hopefully we'll be able to bring that up. 
Yeah, I, I guess in the meantime, it's it's difficult for me to, without sounding like I'm uh, sounding like I'm dodging the uh, buck on this one. It's it's difficult for me when I haven't been party to obviously sales conversations in a working of Crowdays to comment on the the timing of which properties have been sold. I accept I, I accept the point and recognise where you're coming from. However, well, you can see the plan that is now on screen. Uh, does that help you to answer the question? Yeah, can we just uh, highlight perhaps um, where we're where we're referring to? So we've got the L-shaped bund there along the eastern boundary, that northeastern boundary of the site. Um, where we're, where are we referring to? If you could just clarify that as in terms of a point of concern. Yeah, uh, Mr. Hounslow, if it's if if, you, uh, if Mr. Kelly could move his cursor to the left, there, stop in that corner on the outside of the development. That's where the water allegedly came through. It all gathered and then came across the site diagonally and then went out, I think that's what Mr Wood said. So that bung is meant to be in place to stop that happening. Obviously it's not, or it's not big enough. Um, that was the question as to why that isn't in place as we speak, especially as you have people all living on site. And the second part to that question is where the bottom of the L comes across to your right-hand side where the allotments start, what is to stop any future events, flood events, where the water backs up behind the perhaps then provided bung from coming round that end and coming across the site anyway? Yeah, this is perhaps, perhaps again quite a detailed question regard, uh, regarding flows. Um, it's the first part, first part of the first part of the question um clearly similar similar to my first point um accept the point accept the point you make in terms of uh in, in terms of property sales and that and those ha having been sold clearly at first um the surface water drainage scheme which crowdace considered would be would be acceptable for the for the site the llfa and officers expressed their concerns and measures such as this measures such as this are part of a part of the response to that in making sure that you know the defenses are the defenses are in place and di and direct flows the uh, and direct flows the correct way um and again um in the first instance perhaps if we uh, if we hit, if we hear from hillary and happy to uh, happy to supplement anything she ha uh, has to say in terms of uh, in terms of flows a lot of the visits uh, part of the context for me for me saying that is to recognize there were were discussions and meetings with crowdace direct on the site um discussing the, discussing the approach to it and i and i wasn't party to that hence why i'm I'm just giving you a bit of context there in terms of recognizing that Hillary will have been part of the conversation. I wasn't. I wasn't directly there for as, as hopefully you'll appreciate. And I'll ask Hillary Ellis if you're still online. If perhaps that's another question you might be prepared to address if we come back to that later in the debate. Um, so then I have a question for you from Councillor Eileen Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Um, you mentioned the um, policy um, requiring um, the installation to be to um, serve for a one in 100 year event, but we've seen increasing um, heavy rainfalls around this area. And really, I, I've been I've heard from other people in the past that we really should be looking at one in 200 year events. The installation that you're you're proposing to um, put in place, what, what sort of event would that um, serve for? I, I, I don't think uh, I don't think it's clarified here um, anywhere if I'm if I'm not mistaken as to as to what kind of whether it's you know one in 200 year, 100, 300 year, etc. What what I can say is is, is clearly we, ha we have the policy there. I take I take the point in terms of um, you know that the, there's been you know increasing number of um, flood events the last one we do have to recognize yes i take yes i take the point on that and we have you know clearly clearly as a as i've mentioned we have worked with the authority to try and go above and beyond um policy to respond to these events that have happened 
and to recognise the flows that have ta taken place. Hopefully I've clarified the point um, in terms of the discrepancy between the two drawings, and that is part of the, rec uh, part of the recognition of that. Um, so yeah, uh, unfortunately I, I can't give you a specific figure in terms of one in however many year events, but you know, hopefully there is some comfort there regarding that there will be implement, um, implementation in inspections afterwards. And if it's found that, yeah, infiltration rates taking into account of those events are not what the site needs, then there will be remedial measures taken proportionate to the findings at that stage. Um, but of course, I can't I can't preempt uh, the findings of any survey that that will happen later down the line once they've been implemented. Mr. Harmsworth, thank you very much for not only your presentation, but to staying on answering some clearly very difficult technical questions, and we appreciate what you've said to us on that. I'd now like to move on to, we have in the room, I think, Councillor Kate Kell, uh, on behalf of Linton Parish Council, and I think you're going to share your presentation with Corrie Newell, who spoke to us earlier on another matter. Um, yeah, I think I'm going take to... Take a seat. going to do the talking, and uh, Corrie's here additional help um, could you just it. confirm you're familiar with this that you have the consent of the parish council to speak on on their behalf i certainly can and could i please have the slides that i sent in displayed as well we have those available do we need to specify which slides or are we perfect karen do you need to know which ones we need i've got them bear with me okay Right. Um, do you want those slides up before you start, or um, preferably yes, please? Which one do you want to start with? The first one. That's a good place to start. <laughs> um, is that the one you wanted first? Yes, thank you very much. Good. Well, when you're ready. Thank you, Chair, Councillors. Thank you for permission to speak. As far as the parish council is concerned, many questions remain unanswered in this latest submission. Not least that the relevant statutory consultees have not been consulted about highways and landscape changes and that the boundary of this application appears to include the strip of SCDC owned land adjacent to Lonsdale, a conflict of interest which raises further questions over whether elements of the flood mitigation plans can be maintained in perpetuity. However, we would like to focus on the issue that concerns us most. The LLFA and Capita say that the plans in front of you will not increase the risk of flooding in a 1 in 100 year rainfall event plus climate change. But what they don't describe is the exceedance flow route if a more severe rainfall event occurs and the infiltration basin floods from its lowest point by Lonsdale. This information is critical to neighbouring residents whose lives have still not returned to normal following the worst surface water flooding ever experienced in this part of Linton. Local rainfall data recorded on the 20th of July last year shows that the figures used in the worst case model in this application are less than half the volume and intensity that actually occurred. Next slide, please. The Environment Agency predicts some flooding from surface water from this site in rainfall events between the 1 in 100 and 1 in 1,000 year severity. The extent of flooding anticipated for Lonsdale is nothing like that experienced last July. The speed of the flood water was sufficient to take down a six foot close board fence and to spring through retaining walls. The depth was widely in excess of 45 centimetres in areas that are not even predicted to flood on the map in front of you. Next slide, please. So why did this completely unprecedented level of flooding happen? We and the residents of Lonsdale, Bakers Lane and beyond have been waiting for the answer to this question for eight months. The flood investigation report promised by the LLFA, which should offer some possible answers, has still not been delivered. LPC have also been asking for months for the surface water model on this site to simply be run with the actual rainfall data from the 20th of July last year to show how the infiltration basin will perform and how much water will leave the site and where it would flow. This would give us the exceedance route and all the details that are being requested by residents. All climate change reports for Cambridgeshire point to an increase in both the frequency and intensity of summer storms, and therefore an increase in the severity of surface water flooding. Like us, you need the information from the flood investigation, and you need the details of the exceedance flows that will occur in the event that the basin fails. Councillors, these plans have not overcome the previous reason for refusal of this condition. 
We therefore request that either this decision is deferred to allow the information to be provided to you, or that it is simply refused in its current form. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, Mrs. Neill, we may have some questions, and if we may, we'll your part for the, for the questions. Uh, we've used up our time on that. So we have questions from Councillor Thatcher. We'll start with. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, two questions of clarity for me, please. Um, both relate to something you mentioned at the very beginning of your presentation. Uh, you mentioned there was a strip of SCDC-owned land that was, wasn't in the ownership of the applicant that you thought would have an impact on what we're being asked to decide today. Uh, and secondly, uh, there was some clarity on, there were some pieces of information that statutory consultees haven't commented on yet. I was wondering if you could expand on those two points, please. Yes, certainly. So um, with the issue regarding to the um, land, um, it's been known right since the outline, um, or it, it, it was expressed right from the outline, that actually South Kansas District Council own a, a, a good metre or so of the land that sits between this site and Lonsdale. Um, and in fact, permission was put in to cross that strip of land with the foul water connection from the site into Lonsdale. Um, so the, the South Cans are obviously aware, or at least I presume they are aware, of its existence um, because that, was, that came out for consultation. Um, so the plans that have been presented, and I've examined them as closely as I possibly can, but uh, it looks like the, um, the plans in front of us actually include that one metre strip. They go right up to the boundary of Lonsdale. So it includes that, that strip of land that is owned by South Cairns District Council. Um, hence my question as to whether anything that is put into that site can be maintained in perpetuity or even whether it is in the applicant's ownership. Um, regarding your second question, the um, changes that are being required uh, on this site require changes to the landscaping. Uh, on the original landscaping plan that has been approved, there are no buns, there are no ditches, all the planting is therefore in place for none of that um, to, to be taken into account. Our particular concern is in um, the, the buns and ditches because any planting will not be taking into account that it's likely to end up wet, um, particularly in these flood events. So whatever's planted there has to be capable of tolerating either very wet or sometimes potentially in our neck of the woods, also very dry situations. Um, and landscape have not been um, consulted. The second element is highways, and that is particularly important to us because the contouring of the top of the road has also been changed. Um, to try to prevent some of the rainwater coming directly down the spine road and into the site, which of course means it's going to divert it back down and along um, Horseheath Road. Um, you'll note from our copious um, notes that we have commented on the effect of the front of this site on the water that flows down Horseheath Road many, many times. Um, there were previously a number of um, rips um, which ran into field ditches, uh, and the surface water flooding, in fact, if you pop up onto the um, slide just above um, this one, the surface water flooding that exists even in a one in 1,000 year event or supposedly along that um, section of the road is almost non-existent. Uh, and that certainly isn't currently the case. Um, so we, we are concerned by the fact that the front of the site has taken away some of those natural flood defenses and of course the hedge which have soaked up the water. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, I have a question for you from Councillor Heather Williams. Can I just request that in responding to this, you keep it reasonably brief, if you would? I shall try, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I think most of it's been covered. Just, just to confirm, it, it is our um, council asset that it actually appears to almost touch the property of Number 7 Lonsdale. Um, so, but Councillor Batchelor asked really my question. I think my question is now going more towards officers. Okay, we'll Thank come you. back to that later then, if we may. Um, so I think with that, that's all we have. Mrs. Kell, thank you very much indeed. And again to Mrs. Um, Newell for coming to us <coughs> and helping us out. We'll now move on. Um, I think we have online one of the local members, Councillor John Batchelor. Uh, Councillor Batchelor, uh, it's now 1.15. I'm very happy to take your presentation and any questions on it before we break for lunch, if that suits you.
Okay, I won't be detaining you long. Thank you. <coughs> All yours. In, in fact, uh, it's very straightforward. I agree entirely with Mr. Woods and with the parish council, <coughs> and indeed with the comments made by Mr. Kelly. It's quite clear that there are key elements of information which are still missing here. Our only purpose in all this is to get to a point where we can be confident that the solution being offered will protect our local community. Um, we can't say that yet. So given that situation, I'm also asking you to defer this until such time as we have that proper information in place. Um, and whilst I'm in front of you, perhaps I could also suggest that the next one coming up, the foul water, should be viewed together. You can't decide on, in my view, you can't decide on the foul water if you haven't um, already dealt with the surface water. So I will also be asking for deferral on that one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't have anyone lined up with questions immediately. So thank you very much for your presentation. We now pass to the debate and there would be an opportunity to ask questions of officers too, including some of those which were brought up earlier. Just before we do that, I think that we had somebody at an earlier stage seeking to propose a deferral. Um, do I have a proposal to that effect? I suggest that we then take it at this stage. I'll, I'll second it. I have, if I may, second it by my vice chair. Um, Councillor Hales, if you want to ask a, a question or make a point before we consider deferral, you can. Right. It, it's, um, Is that acceptable? So you proposed a deferral, you've got a seconder. Are you happy to take a comment from Councillor Hales before we move to that? Yes. It's, actually, it's actually clarification, please, Chair, if you wouldn't mind, whether it should be deferral or refusal. Um, there are so The proposal many... we have in front of us that's been proposed and seconded is for a deferral. Do you want to contribute to that debate? Oh, yeah. Yes, I think so. Uh, yes, do you want to speak to your proposal then? Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I do think that we are missing key bits of information and one thing that I think would also be beneficial is actually if we have a site visit to understand the logistics of this, to be able to see the gradients for ourselves. And I'm looking at the um, strip of land on the My Camesham maps as well to actually distinguish where these things are gonna go on site, where is the land and where it's not, because I wasn't aware until it was referenced um, that, that we have a, we, maybe we all have to declare an interest now as well. We'll ask Mr. Reid on that one. Um, so I think it should be deferred. I think as committee, we should go out and see it see it for ourselves, the particular public interest, I think, in that. Um, and then we can come to a conclusion, I would say, Chair, on, on both items as well. Um, so, Doctor, and I would suggest that we make a decision if we're going to defer the next item before lunch, because then obviously those people that are with us can can um, uh, have their lunch and not, not have to return um, until next time. Um, so they're my main reasons. I think the, the public interest is... So we're in the debate down. on a proposal to defer. Does anyone else want to speak to that? Councillor Martin Khan, and then I will come back to the seconder. <coughs> I simply <coughs> wanted to say that I, um, I think deferral is a better solution than refusal. We, the, the solution, that the thing might solve the problems, we just don't know yet. Um, and uh, I agree that we just have... Uh, information available, I would agree with the referral proposal. Right. Just before we invite uh, Councillor Batchelor, the second to speak, I, I would like to speak on this myself, just to say briefly, I think we need to just consider, I, I come to no conclusions on this, but from the evidence that we have heard, whether the proposals before us uh, would prevent the problems that were experienced on 20th of July uh, bearing in mind that, of course, the developers are not under obligation to, uh, they say they will go above and beyond, but they're not obliged to deal with pre-existing situations. And secondly, whether by deferring, we might put householders at risk for a longer period. I just say those as considerations. But I, I would now like to ask uh, Councillor Henry Batcher a seconder to speak to the motion. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, just to echo what others have said so far, I think before we as a committee make a decision to either approve or refuse um, the condition application in front of us, I do feel it would be more prudent that we do have the full raft of information that we need to be able to make the decision, uh, specifically around the Section 19 document, which details where the, um, the exceedance flow will go should the basin overfill. Um, should we get another uh, bout of heavy rainfall? I think that would be at the very least of some comfort to those residents of Lonsdale um, to show that the, uh, the, the professional opinion is that the water would flow down Martins Lane and not as we have seen today uh, into Lonsdale. Um, I think also some clarity around land ownership because obviously some of the proposals we have in front of us from the applicant today, there is some question around whether the, what they can implement is within their control or not, given that there has been some question raised about whether um, the, the solutions lie within their land or not. Um, so I think some clarity on those points would be useful. Um, I mean, I do also agree with what others have said, that I think we're getting to a stage where we do need to uh, wrap this up, as it were. Um, but I think we're not at a stage today that we are in full possession of the facts to be able to do that. So. Hence why I supported the, the um, seconded the option to defer. Uh, I think that would be the sensible option. I think Mr. Kelly said at the beginning, we should have the Section 19 report from the LLFA in the next couple of weeks, i.e. before the next committee meeting. So, in, so my view would be the sensible option would be to defer. And I think as was mentioned earlier, the next item on the agenda, uh, item eight, which is the foul water, drainage conditions should also be deferred, given the fact that we've held off on bringing one forward to the committee and not the other because they do work in conjunction. So that would be my view. So I would support deferral of this item and also the next. Thank you. I think having had this proposed yeah. consent. Sorry. Uh, Hilary Ellis, uh, thank you for offering to, I appreciate there were some questions that were raised earlier on. Um, do you think that those questions are crucial to the issue we're currently considering of deferral? Or are you happy to hold them back for the moment? Sorry, I did want to just clarify that the, the Section 19 report um, will be an investigation into, or is an investigation into what happened on the 21st of July, on the 20th of July, sorry, with this, the development site in its state as it was. It won't provide an assessment of once this development site is completed, whether that would or wouldn't have flooded. It is um, an investigation of what happened on that date. We will be better informed to consider that, perhaps. Um, with that, I think it's now time for us to move to a vote on the question of deferral, which has been proposed by Councillor Heather Williams. Uh, can we set up a, a vote on that? I think it is important we... Does anyone oppose deferral? I haven't heard any... I'm just wondering whether it is necessary to take a vote. I think we can probably do this on by affirmation. Yes, agree. Does anyone take a contrary view? Right, we then move on to item eight. And um, does anyone want to make a proposal before we start to consider this? I think Councillor Batchelor wanted to make a proposal, if that's all right. Yes, uh, as, as just mentioned, as, as just mentioned, I think um, the previous um, condition that we've just deferred uh, should be taken in conjunction with the current one we're now considering uh, the foul water. So I would immediately propose that we defer this also. Do we have a seconder for that? Happy to second that, Chair. I thought you might. Uh, are we all agreed that we defer the second? The, yeah, yes. Great. All right. Good. Well, that concludes item eight. Um, we have various other issues to deal with, but I suggest that before moving on the TPO, we adjourn for lunch. Can I just check that the officer who's going to deal with item nine will be available after lunch, or would it be more convenient to take that before lunch? Are you happy to deal with that after lunch? No, do it now, Do it now. The, the, the feeling is that we should take that item nine now. We all agreed on that? Yeah. Yes. Can I ask the officer? I'm sorry, I don't actually know who's presenting on this, but... Jay Patel. Jay Patel, right. My apologies. Uh, Jay, would you like to present to us so item nine? Certainly I can. 
So yeah, I can, Jay, yeah, thank you. Okay. Could you please confirm you can see my slide, please? Hang on one, one moment, please. It's I, I just wanted to remind you, Chair, that I uh, made a declaration of interest in relation to this, that I've taken thank part in the discussion. Thank you. Sorry, Jay Patel, please carry on. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Right, the proposal is to confirm a provisional tree preservation order that was issued in respect of two individual trees at Shepherd's Way, Traversham. Local planning authorities can issue a tree preservation order in the interest of amenity to preserve trees or woodlands in their area. TPOs can be initiated either by the local authority or by request of another party. This request came from another party. Amenity, the key consideration for the local authority is is it expedient in the interest of amenity to make preservations for, or to make provisions rather, for the preservation of trees or woodlands in the area? Amenity is not defined in law, and therefore it is left for local authorities to exercise their judgment. The trees must have reasonable health, visibility, and individually or collectively have a wider impact. Other factors may be considered, such as importance to nature conservation, or response to climate change, but only if the trees achieve the basic qualifying factors. This is a general map showing you the location of the trees. The trees are located outside. I'll just get my laser. Right, the trees are located outside the conservation area of the parish, which is shown in pink here. Uh, the trees are located into in a residential area just off the high street leading to Fullborn. The trees are located on Shepherd's Way, tree one and tree two. They are very close to the new, new built house. And in fact, the house is much, much closer than what's shown on this council map. Uh, I've got four photographs to show you taken from different, uh, uh, different parts of the estate. So the first one was taken from the junction with the high street. The second one, is taken from the road itself, Shepherd's Way. The third one is taken from the path uh, leading to residential houses and the path is adjacent to the car park. And finally, one taken uh, to exit to the road. This is the photograph showing uh, the trees can be seen from the junction with the high street and the trees are here. This is taken from the beginning of the way itself. The trees can be seen slightly better. The third one, which I think is quite important, this is the path taken from the path leading to the residential houses and the car park. The both trees can be seen. And as you note, uh, the house is much closer to the trees than shown on the actual map itself. There's a bench here belonging to the parish council and also a notice board. Finally, this is a picture going out of the, uh, uh, the way itself. You can see the two trees quite clearly there as well. So in conclusion, basically, what I'd like to propose is to confirm TPO 35 for 2021 to protect two individual trees. Tree 1, a beech tree, and tree 2, a home beam, located adjacent to 4 Shepherd Way Traversham. Consultation. The formal consultation started when the provisional TPO was first served to those with an interest in the land. These parties were given the opportunity to submit objections, comments, representations. We have had two responses, one in support of the confirmation and one against. None of the reasons given against the confirmation were of any material concern. Decision. The council can make a decision to amend confirm or not confirm this provisional order. Recommendation, the trees officer recommends that the committee approves the confirmation of this order. That, that concludes my presentation. Thank you for that clear presentation. Um, I haven't done any other qu questions at the moment. I have one question for you myself. In relation to paragraph six of your report, and you mentioned the representation against the confirmation of this TPO, can you just confirm that the reasons given, that it, including the 
leaf fall bird dropping health, and that the trees are too close to a property are not material considerations in your view. That's correct, Chair, that's correct. It's uh, not material consideration. Right. Do we have any questions or can we proceed direct to any debate on this? I think we can proceed to the debate. Hey, uh, Councillor Eileen Wilson has a question for you. I, I just wanted to ask whether it'd be possible to prune these trees to uh, reduce some of the impact on, on the, the house that's close to it. Certainly I can, yeah. So what happens for a tree preservation or trees? Work can be done to a tree preservation or trees by submitting a proper application, like a planning application, telling us what they want to do and why they want to do it. They could even ask for removal of the tree if they can provide expert uh, uh, expert professional opinions to say that the, tr the trees are affecting the foundation or the, tree or the house or whatsoever, right? So they have got to basically apply for to us and we'll look at it uh, and to see whether the works are allowed or not allowed. Of course, we try and make sure that the health of the tree is concerned first before our most concern first. Uh, Councillor Claire Daunton, question? Yeah, could you, could you confirm, Jay, please, that the trees are in the ownership of South Cairns? I'm afraid I can't tell, I'm not too sure if they are. The, the land originally, from what I read, belonged to the people who owned the land where the house was and I think the land was uh, given to the parish council and the trees may be getting looked after by South Kent but I can't confirm that I'm afraid. I believe that's the case. Okay. Right, well, we have the clear recommendation from the trees officer, paragraph 16, that the committee approves the confirmation of this provisional TPO. Uh, does anyone want to speak against that? Are we able to agree this by affirmation? We are. That's, that is agreed. Thank you. Well, it's now just after 1.30, so um, with apologies to uh, officers standing by for other items, I'm afraid, I think we should now adjourn for 45 minutes for lunch and come back to at um, 2.15 to deal with the next item, um, which is, of course, Item 10, the enforcement report and appeals against planning decisions. Unless any members propose to me that we deal with those before lunch. No, let's, let's have lunch. Then. Right, 2.15.
Um, can we go live? <coughs> Welcome back to the South Cambridgeshire District Council Planning Committee. Um, we have um, resolved matters up to item 10, so we're now coming to the enforcement report. Um, who do we have on line on this? Ah, yes. right, welcome. Uh, so we've got your report before us. Is there anything you want to elaborate on or explain? Yes, Chair, so I've got a couple of verbal updates uh, for yourself and committee members. Uh, the first matter is on Smithy Fen. Um, we're currently in the process of procuring an outside agency to serve the planning contravention notices on site. Uh, this is due to the concerns of council officers carrying out the work uh, because of previous incidents. So it's thought best to have uh, professionals that deal with these type of sites. Uh, I hope to have a further update at the next planning committee so that progress continues and that members can feed back to their constituents accordingly. Um, on another matter, um, I now have an update on the planning enforcement service in itself. Uh, John Shuttlewood, who is the Principal Planning Enforcement Officer, uh, mainly for Cambridge City, but most of you will know him, has now been seconded to the Cambridge Investment Partnership and the South Cambridge Chairman Investment Partnership for three days a week uh, for the next 12 months. He will still be part of the team for two days of the week, uh, but on a limited availability. With that in mind, I have therefore been made the lead principal planning enforcement officer covering both South Cambridge and Cambridge City planning enforcement functions. This has also led to an opportunity to change the delivery of the planning enforcement service. So as of the 4th of April 2022, the planning enforcement team will adopt and mirror the areas covered by the development management teams with the Greater Cambridge Air Planning Service. Details of the changes and officers allocated to each area will be placed before you at the next planning committee and will also be circulated to all members by email in the next coming weeks. Um, I'd like to add that over the last few weeks we've made huge strides to improving the service delivery recently, including the reduction of officer caseload, ensuring that those cases that require formal action to be taken are done so as a priority and that the speed in decision-making of cases has been improved uh, by adopting certain checks and also updating members in a more timely manner. I'm hoping that you can already see and feel the improvements being made to the service. We are continuing to make these changes behind the scenes to ensure the best service delivery for members. That concludes my update. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Will. Any questions to all on the report, which we've got on page uh, 129, Heather, Councillor Heather Williams? Uh, thank you. Just on, on what was updated there, it's um, good to hear that you're you're trying to get through backlog. I, I would say, can we just check there aren't any problems with your emails because I've sent in quite a few things now for the last few weeks and haven't even had an acknowledgement. Um, so, you know, and I know that's not, not like, li uh, likely to be the norm, so could you just check the email systems, please? Yeah, so we'll do, because I know we've had discussions previously on the phone, um, and yeah. there does need to be something, because uh, I have been sending some emails through to you, um, so yeah, I'll, I'll chase that up and see where we are. Thank you. That's fine, Wilson. Thank you. Um, on Smithy Fenner, I'm pleased to hear that things are moving forward. Um, we sometimes have residents who report to us new uh, mobile homes arriving on Smithy Fen and always ask us to pass it on to enforcement officers. Is there any benefit in doing that at the moment or will that all be taken into account when, when the notices are being served? Yeah, it, it's always good to have more information. Um, so please forward that on to us and I can forward it on to Ivy Legal and obviously the, the team that we get to procure to do the planning contravention notices. So yeah, the more information, the better. Well, could you just confirm to us if we have enforcement concerns in our in our wards, should we come direct to the enforcement team for yourself and your colleagues, or should we go through the area planning lead in the first yes. instance? Yeah, I'm more than happy for you to come straight to our planning enforcement inbox that you should all have the email address for. Um, we're trying to centralise both the city and the South Cam's planning enforcement inboxes, so it all comes into one place. Because, as you can imagine, having control over both of those, it's quite 
a lot of emails to be going through. So please come straight through to us in the team and then I will move it on to the relevant area officer. One more question, I think, from Councillor Claire Dawson for you. Yes, thank you, Will. Um, I think you've really just answered my question. I, I just wanted to have reassurance that you keep in touch with the local area managers, that there's good contact between you and them. Yes, it is. Uh, it, it's one of the ways that we've tried to speed up the processes where we have, as enforcement now, we have weekly meetings with all the area managers to discuss cases and uh, of particular of note. Um, so, yes, we are going through that. And one last question from uh, Councillor Henry Batchelor. Thank you. Not a question, but as Will mentioned earlier on, I should declare that I'm an unpaid board member of South Cam's Investment Partnership. So, uh, no question, but just wanted to declare that. Right. Well, I think that covers it. Thank you very much for your report. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that then brings us to <coughs> item uh, 11, page 137. Uh, I would say this is fairly self-explanatory. I don't know whether we have uh, anyone Want you to elaborate on this, or whether you want to, Nigel? Actually, sure, I wasn't particularly planning to. All of the decisions that were that were reported on there were all delegated decisions. But if members have got any questions about them, um, I will try and answer them. Thank you. Well, perhaps I could ask a question to lead us off. Um, the second item there, 22220 FL Hill Trees at Babram. Um, there have been applications and appeals going on for rather a long time on that site. Is there any reason to think that this will be the end of the matter or is the further recourse available? Well, Chair, the, the inspector um, did dismiss the appeal, um, recognising that there had previously been a lawful advance certificate dismissed on appeal so that the use of the land had not been established. Um, and the public house use inspector noted was has clearly been abandoned, that it's not been there for 40 years. Um, it's in the green belt. The inspector said it was inappropriate development in the green belt. There were no very special circumstances. There was harm to the carriage and appearance of the area, highway safety concerns potentially, unsuitable location, and potentially biodiversity harm as well. So I think the inspector is quite a comprehensive decision. Um, and there's, I mean, there, there's nowhere to go after an appeal like that, I think. Right, thank you. Sounds like a slam dunk in my on technical language. Any, uh, any questions on appeals or council have anything? Thank you. Um, just on page 146, Horse and Groom, um, which is an odd site, but it's, I'm half the local member for it and Nigel Cathcart is half the other. It was one of those pubs that you could have a drink in one parish and finish it in the next. Um, I mean, they've had permission for everything, including kitchen sinks and, and Lord knows what else. This is one of the rare things that have been refused. Just wondering if we're anywhere near a conclusion on that one. Uh, we're still waiting for the inspector. I, I don't know the timetable, I'm afraid. Thanks. Well, the Bart Simpson <laughs> montage will just have to stay there a little while longer. Thank you. Right. So that brings us to item 12, planning appeal. Now, before we come to this, um, we're asked to consider proposal to exclude the press and public. Obviously, that's something that we would only do if very good reasons. I see Sharon is online, or are you going to leave us through? You're going to deal with this, yes. No, thank you, Chair. So, for this item. We haven't, we haven't, we haven't, we haven't decided yet. Um, members, um, the next item um, on your pink papers contains legally privileged information and you may want to debate that information um, and therefore we, we are recommending to you that for this item we exclude the press and public and that this be an enclosed session. So can I be clear, uh, is it proposed that this planning committee should take a planning decision uh, 
in the absence of the press and public, or is it merely so that we can consider legally privileged paper? Um, Chair, it's, it, is, it is to make a decision based on the options that are in front of members that are in the papers. Um, there is a recommendation from the officer for which option is, is, is the preferred one from an officer perspective, but it is for you to make a decision. But the decision needs you to consider legally privileged information. And for that reason, and because you will need to debate that information, for that reason, um, we recommend that the press and public are excluded. Before we uh, go to that, Councillor Richard Williams and Councillor Deborah Roberts. Councillor Richard Williams. Yeah, I did want to make some comments on that, Chair, if that's all right Please. at this point. Um, I am very uncomfortable about this. Um, I, I understand uh, the reasons that Mr. Blaisby has, has, has outlined, but my reading of the item before us is that we are being required to make essentially a planning decision in secret. Um, and, and I am deeply, deeply uncomfortable with the planning committee deciding planning matters entirely in secret. Um, and I don't actually think I could support that on a point of principle. Right, um, Councillor Deborah Roberts. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm too um, concerned about this and I think it's actually quite unacceptable. If it, we, we looked at the application originally in public and if we are now being told that we need to reconsider that, I think that should be done in public as well. I think that this gives people a very wrong or bad impression of this council um, if we start um, going down the lines of secrecy, which it, which it basically is. If you go into closed session, uh, it's been done it, it's secretly and without the public having the benefit of knowing what the arguments were. <clears throat> and I don't think that's really acceptable. Um, I think uh, we need not have had the pink, um, the pink papers. I think it could have been laid out in uh, a review of the um, previous um, approval. Um, and um, I think that, uh, sorry, previous refusal. And I, I think that we could have had it brought to us as we've had contrary um, information uh, given to us uh, legally um, and, and it could have been explained you need to have had all the bump from a lawyer um, sorry to those lawyers who are in the room uh, but we, we need them to have had that we could have just had an explanation that there were question marks over it and would we like to reconsider it so um, I'm not supporting it going into confidential. I, it leaves a very bad taste, and I think it gives a very bad impression of this council. I think we should have just dumped the pink papers and had it brought before us again for reconsideration. Before we take any further comments, let me make it clear that in discussion of the question of exclusion, we, we cannot refer to the contents of the papers, which are legally privileged. Um, I think it would be a good idea at an early stage to invite our legal advisor to explain the reasons for putting it to us this way so that we can at least consider that. Councillor Heather Williams, you wanted to make a comment. Would you rather hear from our legal advisor first or make your comment first? Well, why don't we hear from our legal advisor and then you can see clarification. Can I, at this point, and I would have been not to have done so before, can I introduce Vanessa Blaine, um, who is the uh, legal officer responsible for this particular case, who can perhaps explain to us what is happening here and to what extent uh, we are being invited to take a decision behind closed doors. Good afternoon, members. I'm the legal advisor on this, as opposed to Stephen, purely because I have conduct of the appeal matter and for no other reason. Can everyone hear? Can, can everyone hear me? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. That better? Yes, thank, thank you. you. The um, reason for the pink papers is because it is entirely right and proper that you are um, you have access and, and read council's advice. That advice is detailed. Um, it was important that we took it in order to decide how we deal with this appeal. Um, you will have noted the reason set out in council's advice, and it wouldn't be fair on you 
for us to come before you and say, well, we've had some contrary advice, you would rightly say, well, what is that advice? So we took detailed advice. It is right, proper and fair that that advice is before you. My advice is that this does not go into the public domain because if it does, we are prejudiced on the appeal before we've started. That is the reason for these pink papers. That is the reason I am advising that it is not disclosed. In order to debate this properly, you will want to refer and possibly read from that advice. And we can't do that um, with the public here without disclosing the contents of that, of Council's advice, which was you know, properly obtained, is thorough, and does give us a direction on which the Council should go. I'm sorry, I can't agree with that. Um, it, it, it seems to me that, you, what are you saying? What you're saying is that in, in one breath we've been told, well, um, let's see, it's gone wrong with it. We've been told in one breath that um, well, we're not going to be discussing the uh, pink papers. Well, actually, we've got nothing else to discuss but the pink papers. I, I think, sorry, Catherine, no, I think... Just, if, if, just one I moment. just wanted to clarify. I think Chair said we couldn't discuss in public the pink papers. I think that's what he said, as opposed to not discussing. We want to discuss the pink papers, and it is right and proper that you should do so. My advice clearly is that shouldn't be in the public domain. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I'm here to represent the public. Um, you may be here to be a lawyer, but I'm here to represent the public. And in my opinion, there is, when a situation is of a, an, of a, a decision that has already been made, um, and that the public believe that decision to have been made in good faith with information, um, and then there's another thing. If, it, if you've got so much good information now, why didn't you have that in front of us when we were actually making the decision the first time? You know, it, this is cart before the horse, isn't it? We should have been told, if this one was um, questionable, iffy, doubtful, got problems, well, we should have been told it then. No good bringing it back to us now and telling us that we've made a mistake and that we need to relook at it. I'm really unhappy about this. Right. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. And, of course, Probably you have an absolute right, right to yes. your opinion. Mm. What, what I would say is this the report came to you with an offer to recommendation to grant. The, the committee took the decision it did, and that's why we're in the position mm. we're in now. I absolutely respect you are here to represent your um, constituents. I am here to ensure and protect the council, the officers, and, and yourselves, both financially and reputationally, and, and that's what I'm going to do today. Mm. Um, before we proceed to others, I think there's been, you have had a, a comment, haven't you? I think it's important that I, I say, as, as chair of the committee, I think it's important that we should discuss these pink papers. What we decide to do about that, whether we decide subsequently to come back to this in open session on some future occasion, is a different matter. But if we do not agree to exclude the press and the public, then this committee will not get to discuss this, this paper, and I think there are some, we need at least to decide whether we're going to do that. Um, so I suggest that what we, I recommend that what we do is to accept the officer's recommendation to proceed to exclude the press and public. There are actually, I don't know there's very many listening to us as it happens, but that's not, it's a matter of principle, so that we can consider the pink papers, and then after that we can decide whether we want to go public, in which case we will still not be able to reveal the contents of the pink papers because they are revealed to us on a legally confidential basis. So that is why I recommend that we do accept, we do support this recommendation and proceed to a, a, effectively a, a closed session. I don't know whether, I, I know some members have already commented on, on that principle. I don't know whether there are any other members who want to comment. Vice Chair. Henry yeah. Yes, thank you, Chair. I mean, we've been given very clear legal advice that we can't discuss the pink papers in public. I do think we need to discuss them, so Woods uh, support going into closed session so that we can do that. And as you mentioned, if at the end of that discussion we decide to then make the decision in open session, that's for us as a committee to decide. So I'd be supportive of, the, of going into closed session. Uh, 
Councillor Heather Williams, you want to come back on that? Um, I did to ask to make some clarification that I sort of got forgotten on your list, Chair. Um, so, look, the reality is it's going to go against the, the gut instinct of all of us here, no doubt, that were elected to go into a private session. And, you know, this is planning as well, so that makes it, you know, it's a statutory function, it's not a political function, that makes it even, even harder. But when we have had areas before, we have been able to sort of have a debate so, and only if we want to refer to certain materials that we would then have to go into closed session. Surely, so we, we have what has been referred to the advice, but then we also have a, a report. Are we, are we surely not able to discuss one bit, even if we can't discuss all of it? Like it does feel like there's more than an either or here. Yes, am I right in saying you're arguing that not all of the pink papers should actually be pink? that we should be able to discuss some part of it without it being confidential. That is not the situation that we face currently. Yeah, I, all legally uh, confidential papers, I understand it. Yeah, I, I think we should be able to have the debate and then, you know, um, be grown up and sensible. We've, we've read the section that really, you know, we've been told about the, the sort of legal advice. Um, we, I'm sure we're all capable of having read that and digested it. Um, so, so long as we don't refer to that bit, surely we can stay in open session to just discuss the report, or am I missing something completely? Because it, it doesn't feel right. I, what I'm going to propose, therefore, is that we agree to go into closed session, subject to an agreement that at the end of that, we will discuss to what extent we feel that some of these papers, subject to uh, legal limitations, should be revealed and our discussions uh, made open. We cannot, however, discuss these papers at all as it currently stands unless we first agree to go into closed session. My view is that if we fail to discuss those papers, there will be potentially serious consequences to this council and that it would be irresponsible of us not to do so. Do I have a seconder for that proposal? A second. Do you have a seconder? I think we've all contributed to the debate. We now have a seconder. Sorry, Councillor Khan, I think Councillor Batchel was ahead of you in seconding that. Uh, so can we, do we need to take a vote on whether we proceed to closed session? I think we probably do need to take a vote on that. Can we set that up, please? Uh, sorry, I, I would have called you earlier if I'd seen your hand, but I think... I'd like to proceed to resolve this matter first. Yeah, we'll come to that in a moment on the, once we've resolved the question of whether we're taking this in closed session. So we now have a vote before us, I think we all know. So if we want to move to closed session to exclude the press and the public, then we will vote green. And if we, want, if we oppose that, then we will vote red. Yes, I think. No, we still want to go. One more. It's just yours. It's, you did it's not... yours, I'm afraid. Oh, right. Okay. Sorry, no, it's just not registered you, so uh, blue first and then the. Oh, right, okay. That's all right, it's still there. It's at the bottom. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The chairman doesn't know how to, how to vote, but um, <laughs> never mind, we get there in the end. So we have agreed to exclude the press and the public on the understanding that we will have a discussion at the end of the this session on to what extent we can reveal this to the public and go open subsequently. Right, we now proceed to the discussion of the pink papers. I said earlier that there would be an opportunity for members to declare